Welcome back to the Pot of Greed. Yeah, another week of uh, exciting, different Yu-Gi-Oh news. Certainly different. Certainly exciting, different. Yeah, well, exciting, controversial even. There were some controversies. Um, yeah, it's been a pretty crazy week on our end, but it's always nice to be able to catch up on the pod with everybody. So, speaking of catching up, we should catch up on on reviews. We should. Uh, so, we have a new review from Apple Podcasts. Keep up the good work. This is from Necessary Evil Twenty Five. What card is he describing? Maxi, that, that D Shifter, does sound like a Necessary Evil. Nibiru. Probably my favorite podcast. Really helped me get more into Yu Gi Oh after returning with Duel Links, but falling in love with Master Duel. Paul and Alec are such good teachers for newcomers that got me into the TCG and playing with real cards at locals. Keep up the great work, because if it wasn't for you guys, I probably would have fell off of Yu Gi Oh after getting owned the first few times. So I guess he's gotten better since then. Yell that at Konami as much as possible. I feel like they don't understand. Yeah, yeah. Maybe tell them. <laughs> <laughs> They'll appreciate us then. Okay, so uh, shout outs, of course, to everybody who's watching the premiere. We appreciate you guys. Put your ones in chat if, if you're, you're here. watching live. Yeah, would love to see what you guys have to say. But there's lots of Yu-Gi-Oh, so I guess we got to. Uh, Let's start from the TCG on down. Yeah, we'll start with the TCG stuff. So uh, YCS Vegas happened yep. this past weekend uh, i think the biggest team ycs ever yeah i believe so um two days of dueling 1713 duelists 571 teams that's a lot but only three ycs champions so the champions of uh the team ycs las vegas are the jawari brothers that's hisam jawari hani jawari and christopher leblanc they piloted their snake eye decks to victory in the grand finals over Team Supreme Pro. That was the team that Sam is on. Sam yep. from Team Samurai X1. It's the team Sam. That's Pac. Hansel Aguero, Pacawat Pamornset. I hope I said that right. Pack and uh, <laughs> Sam. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Basically, they got second place. Um, also, just for a little fun fact, uh, Paulo Gonsalves' team got third place. So. Oh, so despite it being 500 different teams... Some very serious professional players made yeah, it to the end. The expected people were, <laughs> were in the finals. It's, you know. Guys, if you ever think Yu Gi Oh is a lucky game, just look at these results. Yeah, that, that's this always, isn't luck. Yeah, that's true. I always think about that about how like uh, people will cite you know, like Yu Gi Oh is like this coin flip luck based game, but then like every YCS has a lot of just the same faces mm -hmm. in those top cuts. So it's like something. There's got to be some skill or consistency involved here. Like it can't truly be. Coin flips, right? You know what I mean. I mean, it, Chris LeBlanc, Pack, and uh, Paolo didn't go first all day, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like you know, if you were to play against like Pack and just flip a coin like a hundred times, and you got fifty heads, and then he got fifty heads or whatever. I think he'd still win. Yeah, like, like he eighty still percent of those, ninety percent. I mean, who knows? So, um, anyways, but yeah, so there was some controversy at this event. I will only give kind of the general things that I know. And so I'm we not aren't trying to get bogged much. down by some yeah, of because I don't really know that much. So I know that uh, in the finals, Sam had to start his game with a game loss because he had sworn, I think, I, uh, in some way allowed on stream, either when some card was activated or during some interview. Um, either way, though, it was his second warning for swearing on stream. So that's why they... Uh, Gave him a game loss. So, okay. Check this out. I'm checking. If th th a penalty like that doesn't really make sense to me. Okay. Because if Sam wasn't on stream and he swore, it wouldn't have been a penalty. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Like, I, if you can, you can give him the warning, mm -hmm. but I don't think that should ever affect the tournament it, itself because if he wasn't on stream, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, it kind of feels like a mixture of the media aspect of the event mm -hmm. and, like, the event aspect of the event. Because, you know, I'm sure that a swear word or two gets thrown around at every Yu-Gi-Oh event. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, it is still against tournament policy to swear. So, anytime that you cuss when you're dueling, Alec, uh -oh. you are actually breaking the rules. However... 99% of that probably goes unseen, unheard, unreported at I'm, least. Because I'm just saying, anytime someone drops a Nibiru on a board, an unsuspecting Nibiru, there's a, there's something in the in the so in your throat coming up. You're going to say something. Yeah, so Sam had to start his finals round down a game, which I think probably 
really hurt some of the morale, Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously that, you know, they didn't end up winning those finals. So that was really unfortunate. You can see people's displeasure with the situation. If you go to pretty much any Yu-Gi-Oh social media oh, kind of I saw account some posts. now, people, they don't like the the Sam ruling. I know that there is some controversy around players like Chris LeBlanc, but I think that still at the end of the day, it seemed like it was overall a good event, mm-hmm. like, you know, very competitive, very good feature matches, at least some of the ones that I caught. There were a few unfortunate things, like some funny mishaps I noticed. Um, there was, like, one player who, I think it was a voiceless voice player, which, okay, actually, real quick before I get into that, we should probably talk about the deck distribution, because that's what a big distribution? conversation. Yeah, Fire Kings and Snake Eyes made up, like, 75% or something of the top cut of this It was event. pretty massive. Um, yeah. The Fire King Snake Eyes deck, it by itself, was nearly half. Yeah. And then Snake Eyes then took, Snake up Eye another took up another chunk, like quarter of it. So yes, yeah, so the conversation around that is like, you know, is this what people call a tier zero format, and is that even, you know, there's then there's still the conversation of like, what does tier zero mean, or does it I matter if it is or isn't? Getting into the weeds of what it of what defines tier zero is isn't important. I think what is important is, yeah, it's looking kind of tier zero though. Like, yeah, it's looking. It's looking. <laughs> There is a clearly dominant deck, yeah. if nothing else. So I'm sure that whenever we get our next ban list update, um, you know, I guess they'll have to do something to it. I have a feeling that the Fire King Snake Eye deck will probably get some slaps on the wrist, one or two little slap on mm-hmm. the wrist things, because a lot of it is still very new. Fire Kings very, came out last December. New. You know, Bonfire came out, like, last month. So I don't think that a lot of those cards are going to be getting, like, limits or bans, I think that we can expect, you know, maybe something kind of older to get limited or go to two. Or, I'm, know, I'm kinda... looking at Amblo Whale. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's the solution. It's, no, it's not a solution. It's just one of those things that Konami could just hit to call it a hit to the deck. That sounds more like a Master Duel ban list. <laughs> but we'll get into that in a moment. Yeah, but um, Voiceless Voice was the next most represented deck at something like 6% representation. That's hilarious. Which is really pretty sad. Now, also, that gets me into what I was going to say about the Voiceless Voice feature match I saw where there was some player who, I guess, was picking up cards to read them, and then when he would put them back down on the mat, he would place them in a zone where he could then use Relinquished Anima to take them and i guess he had been doing this for most of the day but eventually got caught on stream so. that is a crazy thing to try and pull off on camera yeah it's very surprising like you're sitting at the like, feature match table there's like three cameras on you and like judges, judges everywhere and you're like still what do you pen and tell her you're just gonna like try and pull off this sleight of hand on camera <laughs> yeah that, i was like that's that's pretty wild but then it also made me think more so than just that isolated example like how many times that exact sort of thing just happens in tournaments. Like, for many people, like, just sleight of hand stuff or, like, oh, let me read your card. Whoops, I put it in the wrong zone. I put it in the wrong position. You know, just there's so many things like that. Because so. there's so, there's, it's one of those things that you can get of that if your opponent notices, you could claim it, it's a mistake. But if they don't notice, you know, you get away with something. And that's not... Yeah. That's not good at all. Yeah, Making this perfectly clear, I don't condone these actions. Yeah, you guys, it's a complicated game. There's so much game state stuff. It could be really easy to miss something going in the wrong, wrong zone when there are, you know, 50 other factors mm-hmm. to track all the time. Because you'll be so locked in on trying to figure out what to do next turn. You like what your next play your and point, stuff is. Put your card in the wrong zone. Yeah, then they've relinquished anima, and now, like, it might be too late to kind of fight it because it's like that was several game states ago that you put it when you put it down and so it's like whew, just really intense stuff the i remember seeing a fe- a written feature match of i think it was also a voiceless voice player and they used oh, what well, well, i forget what card it was they ended up sending a dragon off of an, off of an effect that had to send a fairy I've, oh wow! Was that Diviner? Is that Diviner's effect? They need to send a. Uh... I think so. Yeah. Yeah, they sent the uh, Saphira off the Diviner effect, and it's just in the oh, written feature match. Yeah. And I'm just like, ah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think my understanding of how the feature match writing goes, and I, I mean, I've never done it myself. I just talked to a few people who have, is that I think that they're kind of just supposed to like 
write it as it happens. So they aren't judging it. They're oh, so just even if it's it. even if it's a horrible misplay, they still just yeah. have to write it out. Well, because I think that judge is still there mm-hmm. while they're doing the feature match thing, but the feature match writer is just focused on like transcribing what happens, and that's it. Like, so I don't know. I mean. It was, it was a weird thing because they wrote, it's like, send Safira off the diviner, then they set and pass. And it's like, wait, so they they had a diviner, they sent an illegal target and passed? Yeah. They had a whole play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so much happens in Yu-Gi-Oh that's just not, like, legal. It, it leaves me mixed at times because I realize that, you know, it's, when you read it as, like, a person, like, reading the feature match, it's so, mm-hmm. it's like, Wow, how did they let this blatant cheating happen? Oh my god, so incompetent. The judges are incompetent. The writers are incompetent. The players suck. Who got them up here? But then it's like, then you play Yu Gi Oh yourself and realize <laughs> you make the same I, mistakes. I make this, I've, I've made all of these same mistakes, all these same errors, so many like just lapses in judgment. And so, you know, in that way, I'm kind of like, well, have some patience and like empathy for people. Yu Gi Oh is a lot harder to play than people think, especially, I imagine. During a feature match with cameras and eyes and all that stuff. So. It's just weird that it wasn't corrected so that the person writing the transcribing the feature match, they couldn't. Well, so I, oh, I can, I can um, at least shed some light on that is that when they're doing the feature match, they are basically scribbling every play as it happens. They're not even writing it, they're not like typing up a proper article they're just scribbling like search that summon that search that sent that summon like just to keep up with the pace mm. of play and then they later go and like turn that into oh he drew the thing and then decided and considered and then he sent this card but to like get a proper you know published thing so it so for the feature match writer who's just like scribing it down yeah there's no they couldn't have really caught that sort of thing they're just having to scramble to like yeah I imagine everything. like Given, given that they have to do a feature match for every single round, they don't even have time to necessarily verify. Was everything written, written, that I wrote today legal? I don't know. Got to move on to the next round. Yeah. And like, so, it, it was just a weird the, thing to read. I was like, oh, that's... Huh. Right, yeah. it's it's uh, It feels like it's a lot to put these events together and like do the coverage for them. I do want to give Konami some props, though. I think that this was probably the best YCS yet in terms of like giving... Visual coverage, like they had, you know, charts There was and stuff a lot of coverage. With, like, deck things. They had a lot of interesting sort of video cut-ins between rounds, even though the round weights were as long as they usually are. The commentary was good, too. Yeah, commentary was good. Our friend Pheromone has been a regular commentator now on a lot of these Yu-Gi-Oh! streams. Tom Box from MST TV. He's also done a really good mm-hmm. job. Shout-outs to them. I think that they are um, really breathing some new life into Yu-Gi-Oh! commentary that has... Otherwise, been a little bit more. Uh, you said it's dusty. Wow. I won't confirm or deny, but I think that some new blood and commentary always helps. Just because you know, um, Yu Gi Oh is a game where I've always. I don't really think it's like a an easy spectator game per se. You gotta like, really, it can be know. really dull, and if you don't know what's going on, it can just kind of go over your head. So I think some commentary, some commentators. Who are, you know, kind of engaged and excited and, you know, while also being informed can really breathe some life into it. I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is a lot like baseball. Uh, you need to re- you need to know what everyone on the field's job is and what they're specifically doing at every moment to actually enjoy it. Otherwise, you're just watching a guy with a stick and it's just like, oh, he missed again. Oh, he missed again. Oh, he missed again. Foul ball. <laughs> yeah, so they... Yeah, there are also some cool playmats that came from this event. I know they ha- this is where they uh, had that Pot of Greed collection oh, yeah. playmat. If anybody gets their hands on that, hit me up. I would love to have a copy for myself. Maybe I'll buy it on eBay. Uh, okay, so I think that's pretty much it for YCS Vegas. Left some sour tastes in a lot of people's mouths. Mm-hmm. Um, but first kind of covered YCS, majorly like streamed YCS, of this new format. We did have Costa Rica the past weekend too. Mm-hmm. But um Yeah, big win for Fire Kings. Big King big wing big wing. Fire King big, Snake Eyes. Big win for Fire King Snake Eyes. Big win for the Jawari brothers. Mm-hmm. And um it's and a big still, win say, for Konami. Yeah, I'd say a big win for Konami. I mean I think people they have mixed feelings on the format itself, but 
it doesn't seem to be a bad one. It seems like the top players are are getting a good bit of joy out of playing it. Well, that's great. Now we can talk about the next TCG product that was recently announced. Wait, which one? I bet you're excited. It's Battles of Legend Terminal Revenge. So, yeah, we've got the announcements of our next Battles of Legend set. This one is, uh, it features the... Oh, yeah, that's the Magia guy. Yeah, basically Blackluster... Bla- no, it... Dark Magician of Chaos. Yeah, riding the Blue, the riding blue, the blue Eyes, Eyes Ultimate. Ultimate Dragon. Instead of Black Luster Soldier. Wow. So this is uh, Battles of Legend Terminal Revenge combines the storytelling of the Hidden Arsenal series with its own signature blend of foil-ups for popular cards and gives Duelists another shot at tournament-level cards. So we don't know exactly what those will be, but that's a pretty exciting blurb, I would say. Combined, it's a can't-miss all-foil summer dueling blockbuster. All-foil. They're really hyping up these new packs. Yeah, they, Summer dueling I'm blockbuster like, I'm, I'm of the, the year. Word in here. Like, let's go. Tales from the Terminal World. So it features brand new cards for four of the most popular themes introduced in the Dual Terminal Arcade game. That's Ice Barriers, where you'll get to freeze out your opponent with a new level 10 synchro monster that summons an Ice Barrier from your deck, extra deck, hand, or graveyard whenever your opponent special summons. I do know one Ice Barrier p- player, and they are happy. You can also find a new version of Brionic, the first of the dragons trapped in the Ice Barrier. Then there's Genex. Genex Controller, the little normal monster that could, is getting more than a new coat of paint. You can use it to link summon a brand new Link 1 monster, everyone's favorite. Link 1, That can maybe. generate theoretically limitless normal summons. What an interesting way of wording that. As long as you can keep adding Genex monsters to your hand with card effects, you can keep normal summoning them out right away. Perfect for assembling powerful synchro monsters like the new level 10 Genex synchro in this set that can repeatedly negate and destroy your opponent's monsters by banishing monsters from your graveyard. I know one Genex player that's pretty excited. Do ya? Mm-hmm. Just one. <laughs> Infernoid. The world-shaping flood of Infernoids began in Secrets of Eternity and continues here. Fusion summon a new level 1 Infernoid fusion monster that swiftly multiplies the number of Infernoid monsters you have in your graveyard, then finish your opponent off with a devastating Link 4 Infernoid Link monster. Pretty exciting. They never had one of those before. No, it's not. Um, and since Link monsters have no level or rank, it won't count against the 8 or lower total level slash rank restrictions to special summon most Infernoid effect monsters. That is true. Finally, there's Ritual Beasts. The bonds between spiritual beasts and their tamers are reforged. You can only special summon each main deck Ritual monster, ritual Beast monster once per turn, so you need as many tamers and beasts in your deck as possible. Fans of this strategy can find a new version of Lara, one of the original Ritual Beast tamers, as well as two new ulti-class Ritual Beasts for your extra deck, including a Link monster. I do know one Ritual Beast player, and they're excited. So, what's uh, what's your take on these? I know this one person who played all three of those decks, except for Infernoids, is going to be very excited. Okay. It's got nothing for me, though. So, you're talking about Alex? Yes. Because they can't know that. Just I mean, tell them. No, I was not going to tell them. You doxed him. You doxed him on live pod. So, so I mean, what about you? What are you? I just got nothing for me. I didn't. Yeah. Really, I didn't really play these archetypes. I think. I think it's cool. I guess. Yeah. The um, I played the Ice Barrier structure deck that came out, and they certainly could use help. So you know, I'm glad for them. Yeah, I think this is pretty neat. I was wondering how they were going to import these cards because we kind of had known about them in the OCG for a few months. Mm-hmm. Though I have no idea what the Magia guy has to do with Dual Terminal. Yeah, I think that they're just kind of looking for a way to just kind of merge it all into one product, which I don't dislike. It, it feels weird because it's clearly a dual terminal terminal style product, but look what's on the cover of it. Uh, on top of that, you'll find new cards that bolster strategies introduced in Phantom, Nightmare, and Legacy of Destruction. Uh, plus, the set contains cool cards from many different Yu-Gi-Oh! manga and animated series, including cards from the story of Sky Strikers. Wait, what? In this set, mm-hmm. could support cards in Phantom Nightmare because we know what's in Phantom Nightmare, and I can't uh, even think of. I mean, what is it New Ubell stuff? New, but Ubell is New Ubell stuff supposed to be coming out in Legacy of Destruction. Yeah, is it more? Probably not. I don't know. I don't know what they mean by that. And there's also Legacy of Destruction, which I figured that would be like Yugi's sarcophagus stuff, since that's kind of anime. Like, but related. But that should also be in Legacy of. Yeah, like it's a start in Legacy of Destruction, and then maybe there's like more in here. 
That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not 100%. Oh, I think I know what they're doing. So we've had those kind of um, those promo cards that got announced for You Bell, the one that's in that art book, and the, uh, the Summon Skull retrain. You think they'll be in here? They might be in there. Okay. That, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, um, and as always with Battles of Legends sets, Terminal Revenge will feature a lineup of popular cards getting foil upgrades as well as some popular tournament cards you can use to up your game this summer. They don't mention what these cards are. This is specifically tournament cards. But that, yeah, typically tournament, mm. popular tournament cards implies that it's stuff that's used in tournaments today. This could be hinting at some early reprints of things like SP Little Knight. Or maybe like you know, wanted seeker sinful spoils. Now I would that would floor me seeing an SP Little Knight reprint in the summer. Yeah, it'd be a little sooner than expected compared to like waiting until the Mega Tens in like maybe October. But um, this comes out on June twentieth, and that's only like around two months after um, Rarity Collection two. So it makes me believe then that Rarity Collection 2, here's my here's what I'm calling. Rarity Collection 2 will likely have older staple style things, like established mm-hmm. staples from the last you know few years, few couple years maybe. Um, and then the few little staples that they toss into Battles of Legend might be on the newer end. That would be my guess. I also think that that's the only way to really differentiate the reprints because these are it's just a lot of reprint sets yeah. like because between rarity collection and then this and then what will likely i guess be tens to reprint archetypes from the past year there's just a lot of reprints going We're about on. to be spoiled in reprints y'all this whole format about to be reprinted and that's not me complaining by the way i mean i think that reprint sets are a good thing mm. i just i remember last year feeling like the battles of legend like from last year felt a little bit flat well wh- which one was ours last year Oh my god, I don't remember. Cause it wasn't a Brothers of Legend, right? Yeah, it was. It was back to Battles of Legend. It was Endless Revenge, Relentless. Dark. I don't even. Know I, yeah, I don't remember what it was. Not they're all running together now. I, I know that it did have Zeus, so that was cool, and it did have. Um, I think IP Mascarena were kind of the two. Yeah. The two big reprints. I think that was Relentless Revenge. I want to say so. There's so many. There's been so many Battles of Legend there sets. They been. all kind Why of. Why did we randomly do Brothers of Legend? It had the Karibo Brothers. Yeah, but they changed the name and that confused and me. And now we're back to Battles of Legend. Okay, fine, fine. Either way, um, yeah, I mean, I remember last year feeling like the Battles of Legend set wasn't as, like, not super memorable, but. Um, this seems like it's potentially cool. Uh, it's rough because I know that like Ice Barrier and Genex and stuff aren't the most popular themes in the world. Infernoid kind of has like a bit of a. I think Ice Barriers are substantially more popular than Genex. I think they all. <laughs> okay, are. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I've had to rate them in popularity. These four. Genex is a two. Well, like just it just from most to least popular, I think Infernoid is number one. Infernoid is number one. Uh, I think. Ice, Ice Barrier, Barrier is number two. Then Ritual Beast. Ritual Beast Genex then is Genex. probably number four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, anyways, you can also pull like this cool Black Magician of Chaos um, or whatever and Riding on the Blue Eyes. That could be a fun card. I'm sure that'll be QCR. Are they still going to be doing QCR? That's it. So. I'm trying to remember what that card even does or what's its uh, fusion requirements. They are. So uh, it's literally what you think it is. Black Luster. So, I mean, it's like Magician, Magician of Black of Chaos, Chaos and like. Blue is it the ritual dragon. or the I don't know. You maybe should look it up. I'll look it up. But while you are, um they are gonna be doing quarter century secret rares okay. for some cards in the set. So we are still in the quarter century celebration. I, 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 maybe it's just not gonna end. <laughs> like maybe it just the twenty fifth anniversary. From now, we're still talking about the We're QC. just always in the twenty fifth anniversary. I don't know. <laughs> I mean I don't hate that. I do think last year's Battles of Legend though, like the Loki had like too many. There, there, were too there were too many. There were. I remember I, I pulled like that like Hydra snake thing or whatever <laughs> as a QCR, yep. and I was looking up the price the other day, and it was worth like three dollars or something. So, I was just like, "This is a QCR. It's supposed to have a you some thought. more perceived value." You but I, I think it'd be cool if this set maybe only had like. I'll, I'll go back to the idea I've always had, which is like. Five of these, maybe per set or something. I don't know. Just keep it more contained so it feels 
more special, and you don't, you can give the rarity to to like one isolated you know, card, special cards, or it'd be cool if okay. How about for this one ice barrier, one infernoid, mm-hmm. one Genex, and one ritual beast card gets like you know their, whatever their new big boss is. Yeah, I only the boss, that, and that's like it. But I know it'll be like three of their cards and a bunch of reprints. Yeah, else, so. it'll be it'll be, it'll be too many, really. I mean, that's the, not a bad uh, thing. Okay, so I looked it up. The uh, Dragon Magia Master. It takes a... Well, this, these are weird summon conditions. Oh. Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Okay. Or three Blue Eyes Monsters. Plus one Chaos or Black Luster Soldier Ritual Monster. Okay, so it's a little bit more open-ended. <laughs> but, like, when it says any plus one Chaos, so this is any like, Chaos Ritual Monster? Yeah, like Blue Eyes Chaos Max or huh. Magician of Black Chaos. Like, I mean, because most of them that have the word chaos in their name are it's just Blue Eyes and Dark Magician. That is ones, true. I think. It is in, I'm confused why Black Lesser Soldier is even in this, given that it's clearly pictured in this artwork is Dark Magician of Black Chaos or Demok or which who's the real one is it black chaos or chaos is that the real will the, will the real dark magician please stand up yeah um so interesting i mean i'll be picking up the set you guys know it's battles of legend i'm always going to try to open a box or two of it even if it's not my favorite set each year i think that it is still a pretty exciting one and i might just be not i might just be selling it a bit short i mean so. i'm typically a fan of them because they have a lot of anime archetypes in them it's just I feel like they used up a lot, a lot of their gas when we had actual Yu-Gi-Oh animes airing. Now that we don't, the Battles of Legend have been really scraping to get that anime into this ga- into this card game. Well, now let's move on to Master Duel because there's a few exciting announcements to speak of for that game. The first big one actually is that we've gotten some updates on the poll results for new sleeves in the game. There was a Japanese poll and also an American poll. I was not aware that there were two separate ones. Okay, what you got? So in the Japanese poll, it seems like Trap Tricks Sarah won. So she will be getting the next... She'll I'm be getting looking, sleeves in a I'm new looking update. that one up because I don't remember which one is Sarah. Yeah, Trap Tricks Sarah is the Trap Tricks Link monster. It's kind of the... It's the greenish looking one. Yeah, green haired like little girl kind of laying in the grass or whatever. And she... Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, the Trap Tricks are popular. People like them. Um, sure. So, for some reason or another, people really like him. And uh, Morin Finn was in second place. I don't even remember what, I don't know what car that is. Wait, that sounds familiar. Morin Finn, M O R I N P H E N. Yeah, I, I, I. They were trolling like a mother. Wait, what is it? Show me. Which what card is that? Oh, <laughs> that old thing. Yo, yo, they were trolling on that. that got second pole. place. Wow. And number three was Diabell Star, so that thing beat out Diabell Star. They That's a surprise. They were trolling so hard on the Japanese poll. <laughs> well, in the meantime, um, I think our U.S. poll is down to Diabell Star versus Dark Magician Girl. See, now that sounds like a Western poll. So it's right. old waifu versus new waifu. Like drunken girl failure and, and magician like, girl. Magician girl. <laughs> it's like uh, that one Jujutsu Kaisen meme. It's like. The greatest waifu ever, or whatever, versus like the strongest waifu of today, or something like that. I, I have know. no idea what that meme is. Okay, it's a, <laughs> it's just a meme. Anyway, the um, but yeah, uh, so they beat Max C. I mean, that's Max no C was in the, Max C was our version of Morin Finn. Oh, uh, that the was meme, our troll pick. The meme okay. kind of troll pick that I'm honestly glad it didn't win because I just think that Maxi's art doesn't on a sleeve wouldn't really yeah, look, it look horrible. It like, it like nothing. Look like anything. The I actually don't know who wins between Dark Magician Girl and Dia Belsar. It's just it's a battle of like retro versus new. Yeah, for those listening, um, maybe if you're in the premiere right now, you can put it in the chat. What? Which which girl who who's you know Diabell Star versus Dark Magician yeah, girl? Who, who's the one? Like who do you vote for? Yeah, I mean if I had to pick, I think I'm. So here's the thing about this poll and why I don't think it really like means anything. They're gonna both make it. In. I that's what, exactly they're, what they're I was gonna thinking. just turn them both just into sleeves. Make them both in the sleeves. They'll do what they did with like that structure deck poll a couple of years back. <laughs> where like yeah here's like the order of popularities. This will just kind of tell us maybe the order to make them, but they're. 
you know they were going to make some Diabell Star sleeves. They do that with pretty much every kind of new ace sort of monster. And you know Dark Magician Girl sleeves would come at some point. She'll yeah. literally probably be the theme for the third anniversary. Yeah. She'll, she'll probably take that from Red Eyes, and she'll be, you know, the one they talk about. So, uh, I mean, not saying I don't like either one, but just that, like, they're both going to be in the game. So. Yeah, so, you know, vote with your heart. Yeah. Not hard, given the subject matter. You know, given, given the results, maybe. Never mind. So, we'll anywho, that that's joke. not all. Because Master Duel just got a new ban list. Oh, well, they hit one card, away. huh? Well, they hit some cards. Um, they hit one card, the two. So this new ban list is going to be going into effect on March 8th. But um, a few different cards moved. Branded Opening went from two to one now. Okay. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. Or not really a big deal, but it slightly changes the branded strategy. They're cutting into its consistency once again. If you've you know been listening, you probably remember that hitting branded seems like it's kind of just a a routine thing in Master Duel. It's kind of like hitting T elements. You just keep picking at different parts of it. Yeah, it's a lot like that. I uh, I am not I'm not super invested in branded one way or another. I'll be honest. Like I I used to like the Despia deck. It became the branded soup. It's a very strong deck in ranked. I'm currently in like master tier two, so I've been playing against flex. Yeah, been playing against plenty of branded. I think branded opening to one from two will shave the consistency down a good bit. I think it really is. They're trying to make it as hard as possible for them to just reach like branded fusion and other key cards. So I don't hate this hit. Um, I'll get back to it in a second. Water enchanters to the temple was previously at one and is now at two. That's kind of strange. I actually thought it was a two to begin with, but apparently Let's it's go. been a one. Adventure engine is back, or kinda, probably. I mean, I mean, I've been seeing a little bit more of it in ranked. Two makes two. I think two makes a good argument for it. Yeah. So I think that the adventure engine it's died off, and they they're realizing people aren't really. It just doesn't seem like it's a threat, and so putting this to two, I don't think will really make too much of a difference. Mm-hmm. I, got, I think it's a good thing for people who want to play it, but super heavy samurai soul piercer went uh, to two. Now, this is a hit to Super Heavy Samurai, which anyone could have seen coming, but it's a bit of a surprise that it only went to two and not to one, since one would probably be a truly effective hit to consistency. Two feels, two feels statistically relevant and nothing more. Yeah, like this just feels like another one of those cases of Master Duel being all like, you know, it, this has like a 60% win percentage and we want it to have like a 59% win yeah. percentage. So we're going to just, we'll just tap on the wrist. Um, now, Soul Piercer is easily the best of the kind of like of main your main deck, deck cards. Just, you know, yeah. you can summon it, turn it into the Scarecrow, and then like things get kind of wild it from gets there. Effect and grave. But um, yeah, I guess this is what, this is what you should have probably expected from a Master Duel yeah. list: a Sounds single card right. going to two in a very powerful strategy. Now, the next one is one that's really got people up in arms, or not up in arms, but like it's a bit of a head scratcher for a lot of people. Parallel Exceed went from three to two. So, mm. you might remember that the Math Mech kind of Cybers Pile deck is one that not a lot of people love and have wanted to get right. hit. And that when they finally decided to hit it, they put Math Mech Diameter to one and did not hit Math Mech Circular, which everybody kind of knows is the best card for starting your Math Mech combos. This time around, they still did not hit Circular. Instead, they hit Parallel Exceed, a non Math Mech mm. card that is still used as an extender in a lot of Cybers and Link strategies. So instead of being at three, it's at two, and this slightly reduces the consistency of seeing the card. So, I mean, maybe the idea with the hit was they could hit circular, right? And that Mm -hmm. would directly impact the one deck they're looking at. Right. Or they can hit parallel exceed, and that marginally hits this deck, but also any other deck that wants to run it. Which I think is part of the concern for people is that, like, if you're running... Like, for instance, Trap Tricks decks typically use Parallel Exceed. Because they'll make Sarah, and it lets them make, like, an Xyz monster for free. And now they can't do that, as reliably, at least. Because Master Duel's tired of seeing y'all play that card. Yeah, apparently so. Take it out. Now, there are some noteworthy things to keep in mind with this hit, too, um, that I should point out to people. Is that 
two Parallel Exceed means that Parallel Exceed can still use its effect to summon another copy from the deck, but your likelihood of seeing it is lower. And also now, if you see two Parallel Exceed in your hand, you're cooked. <laughs> then now that's really not good because there's not one to get from the deck. In addition to that, Parallel Exceed cannot be used for Small World anymore if you want to still be able to resolve that its effect. True. Because Small World means that you'll have to banish a Parallel Exceed from your deck or hand or you know either one and start your small world line and that's obviously you know so there are some subtle meaningful I mean, nerfs to putting parallel exceed to two but i really but just I think master duel might have also been helping them okay by knocking it down to two there's less chances of you opening two in your hand yeah you know so it's they just want y'all to be optimal with your deck i building. really would have preferred circular <laughs> just get hit it's they really are dancing around the issue here. They don't make ban lists for you; they make them for the algorithm. Yeah, but my hope is that they will, over time at least, just I guess they'll probably just keep chipping away at Cyber's pile mm. as indirectly as they possibly can over the next probably year. <laughs> my hope is Circular stays at three and the deck becomes unplayable because of all the different random hits. They hit everything around Circular. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was still saying back when the big the Circular discourse was like just starting that it'd be interesting to see them hit like Mathematics Sigma because that's typically what Circular sends and then Sigma can summon itself back. And so I was like, well, maybe you ban that. But Master Duel isn't really like banning things too often. I feel like somebody on the Master Duel team plays <laughs> Mad They play Max. Max, like they have a vested interest. <laughs> They're like, don't you touch Circular. That's the only one. And then two cards just came off completely. That's King of the Swamp, which was at one, is now free. This was kind of a hit to TR Elements last year. Oh, okay. Um, And Prank Kids Meow Meow Mew, which was at one, is now at three. I wonder what deck that hit. What, the Prank Kids Meow Meow Mew? <laughs> well, so it's funny you would think, oh, I hit Prank Kids, but technically it was hitting a lot of... Because a lot of strategies just use small bits of prank kids. They engines, did. I remember so. the prank kids engine pandemic. Yeah, like I remember like an Ad Emancipator kind of block dragon was a big mm-hmm. thing. People would just use prank kids, Roxies without any others. But yeah, so that's the ban list. It's not a huge one. It's not like it doesn't feel like it's like a heavily swingy ban list. I believe we've got a Master Duel Duelist Cup coming soon Ooh. and so they typically as people have now pointed out the typical style is small band lists before duelist cups big band lists after duelist cups because duelist cups are the 72 hour hellscape where they get probably a lot more data on the high level mm-hmm. you know sweaty people who haven't gotten a chance to use the bathroom and take a shower in the last three days so all i hear is you're, you're about to get your world's invite I'm not going to be playing the Duelist Cup. You are. Right. No, um, actually, I'd, I'd love to know if anybody listening, d- like, plays the Duelist Cups and, like, does that grind. Because it, it feels psychotic to me. But, <laughs> uh, you know, people can do it. Maybe it's not as bad as it sounds. So that's the ban list for Master Duel. Um, Snake Eye did not get hit. It's new. So yeah, not surprised by that. Yeah, I've been seeing too. a lot more of that in ranked. I built a deck. I'm sure after the Duelist Cup, they'll get their, you know, little get hits little, as well. Get a little slap on the wrist real quick. Yeah, don't know what they'll do. Given that it's Master Duel, it'll probably be like Snake Eye Ash will go to two or something. And... Now, now, enough about Master Duel. Let's talk about a better game. Okay. Let's talk about Duel Links. Uh, Specifically, okay. Rush Duel Links, because uh, at least as far as the big update we have for Duel Links now, there's pretty much nothing for Speed Duel Links and everything for rush duel links and i don't want to hear it speed duel links players rush duel links players have been starved for content for a minute now and we need this we we really do but uh before i get to uh rush duel links let's talk about the ban list okay so they finally hit that tachyon thing that robbed you of your victory yes uh tachyon got hit and a few other decks got hit and some cards got brought back which is really nice if these ads stop popping up on my screen that would be really nice okay check it out so what they do Tachyon Transmigration goes to limit one, which means, oh, I have to keep going first. Ta- it went to limit one okay. along with Coach King Giant Trainer. Oh, that's the rank eight Xyz. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now you have to choose between getting your your advantage or your Omni Negate. Right. And it seems you're, you're probably just going to have to pick your Omni Negate, so they're not going to be able to run Giant Trainer anymore. Well, Shiranui got... Spirit Master, limit one. 
Then she and Spy went to limit one. Vengeful Servant went to limit one. She and Spy? She and Spy. Don't ask me why. I do not know. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dee Dee Savant Thomas went from one to limit two, so Dee Dee got a little bit of reprieve there. Shirinui Solitaire goes from unlimited to limit three. That's actually a pretty huge hit for zombie strategies because, as you know, a lot of the good traps in Duel Links are limit three. Ice Dragon's Prison and stuff and Crackdown, they're limit three. And so Solitaire going to limit three means, what, do you want your consistency or do you want your good traps? Yeah, there's a choice involved. You can have both, but it's going to cost you. Yeah, it's not going to be ideal. We're not even done yet. Galactic Spiral Dragon, one of the best extenders in the uh, Tachyon deck, goes to limit three. So they're in the same situation as zombie players are with Solitaire. Do you want your good traps or do you want your free extender? Yeah. And we're not done yet. Now, the rest is actually good news. Okay. Uh, Evil Swarm Ophion goes from limit one to unlimited. Condemned Witch from limit three to unlimited. Cosmotown goes from limit three to unlimited. Mech Knight Blue Sky goes from limit two to unlimited, and Lady Debug goes from limit two to unlimited. So a lot of cards got freed up off the ban list, and that makes sense. And I don't think any of these cards were like relevant in the last few formats, so might as well just unleash them and you know, let people do what they want. As someone who played Cosmos very recently, having Cosmo Town on limit three was actually very annoying. Just it meant you either played at one or none. Yeah, I remember Fairmont played that in the uh, the Invitational, mm-hmm. so I got to see some of the cool power of Cosmos. The um, the the Tier Zero deck, I don't think is truly defeated, though. I mean, I think those are some meaningful hits, though. Like it's, they are. There's a real. It it reminds me of why I like the um. What was I going to say? Like the the the. Limit one, limit two, limit three system. Yeah. Because it's kind of a decision-making thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can still use these cards, but you can't use them alongside, like, all the good stuff. Yep. So, it still leaves some power in the, some decision-making and agency in the duelist hands. Because you are not forced to, like, just say, okay, well, it's banned, you can't use it anymore. It's more like, you can, you just have to make a choice. What's more valuable to you? What's more valuable to the next duelist? That's pretty cool i know everybody always talks about like would that be cool to have in the tcg it would be harder to enforce it it would be but in a digital (laughs) game i think it's a very cool system yeah but i do think the tachyon deck will still be a strong deck maybe not as dominant as it was before i think a lot of players are going to run their galactic spiral dragons and just replace their limit three traps with book of moons Mm -hmm. and other just kind of like more generic interruption cards. Mm -hmm. It's not as strong as ice dragons prison, but I think still more times than not, it'll get the job done. Yeah. Ice dragons prison got so much mileage in that Mm -hmm. event. I was watching it. I was just like, Oh, this card's brutal. I mean, it really is. It's a painful card. It's painful. But, uh, it, I think those hits are very meaningful. They won't be able to play through quite as much adversity. And then for the players who do decide to, you know, run their good traps, then they won't have as much extending to do when their boards get broken or when they, th- they finally get stopped. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you can optimize, you can kind of prioritize offense versus defense mm-hmm. if you want. And I think that's something that's, you know... Like, it's kind of cool. Like, you can go for, do you want to have, like, more monsters that kind of, like, come out and aggress on your opponent? Or do you want to have more defensive traps? Mm-hmm. Like, if you choose to lean into one sort of stat build, then your other will be, like, weaker or less potent. And so... And I'm really curious to see how this affects Shiranui list. Because I think they're just fine with hits to Solitaire. I find that the um, Zombie World Bear Drock strategies rye more on solitaire than they do of course they they like solitaire and they love it but they like it and they love it yeah like i think solitaire and spirit master being hit are very manageable for them so i think this format just continues but probably in the fashion that it was probably supposed to in the first place a little bit less dominant yeah a little bit less crazy um i mean cool it's always it's kind of fun to hear like about dual links kind of um fan list updates because i feel like they typically go so under the rug just because like the game itself is not talked about as much and um, all that. The uh, But enough about Speed Duel Links. That stuff is old. We're, we're talking about Rush Duel Links, the hot stuff. Okay. So, we have a new, we got a new update. And 
and maximum summoning is been has been added to Duel Links. Yeah, I remember there was the announcement of that at the Tokyo Dome event. So, so check it out. Just for logging in, you know, you don't have to do anything. They're gonna give you your first maximum summon monster. They're going to give you Harpy Lady Sisters and Harpy Lady Sisters L and Harpy Lady Sisters R. Together, they make the Harpy Lady Sisters Maximum Summon Monster, but you also get the Harpy Lady Sisters Elegant Egotist Archive Skill. And Archive Skills can be used on any character. or well, have the Rush Duels, Rush Duel character, of course. Right. But you can use it on any one of your Rush Duel characters to run a Harpy deck that can uh, recover its Harpy Lady Sisters pieces from the grave so you can do your Maximum Summons more easily. But if, and all this comes with a new login uh, bonus stamp campaign where there's a legendary duelish rainbow pack, gems, a dream pack, an SRUR choice ticket. I gotta say, I hate, I do hate their new kind of a uh, pack system that they do. So in Duel Links, we're used to having these things called tickets, and you can exchange tickets for cards of certain rarities. And uh, dream tickets were some of the, were the best ones because they could get you even they can get you cards from boxes that you couldn't even pull or you couldn't pull easily. Mm-hmm. But they've lately been doing I think since the uh, the sevens campaign are pa- dream packs or rainbow packs where instead of getting to pick a card they just they give you a nut it's a gotcha chance. Uh, out of a pool of cards that reminds me of how they're doing the master duel mm-hmm. like. Second anniversary thing where like you get a ticket and then there's like ten packs and you kind of pick one and then some stuff's in them but you don't get like a guarantee. Yeah, you don't have any choice. Yeah, I don't love those. I mean, I sure. like I, I was very annoyed because I got a legendary dualish rainbow pack and uh, you guarantee you're guaranteed a, a prismatic card of high rarity and I'm like oh man I, I haven't really completed my collection of uh, rush duel cards this could this could be great I can get one of those boss monsters open the pack I got a psychic trap yeah just a reminder too about what maximum summoning is it's the one where like it's like three monsters, but it actually literally takes up the three zones, correct? Yeah, you summon three monsters at once, mm-hmm. uh, called a maximum summon, and then they essentially become one monster. They share stats and effects, and they attack, and you interact with them as if they are one monster. Very cool. Most of them are. Most of them have some type of destruction protection. The uh, the two. I, I was going to get into that a little bit later, but the two ones that. Um, that Yuga and the new character use both have protection versus traps. I believe the Harpy Lady Sisters, I can look at it right here. The Harpy Lady Sisters can not, yeah, they can also not be destroyed by trap effects. So they are a hard counter to the Rush Duel meta that we've dealt with because we're a trap heavy meta game. Widespread Ruins our best card, and Maximums, they can't be affected. Yu Gi Oh! tends to. In almost any format, kind of the traps tend to be the strongest thing early they on. Are. Just because like, if it's like one-for-one removal or mm-hmm. battle protection, stuff like that. And moving on, I did mention that there's a new character. We have a new event going on in Rush Duel Links right now. This is Maximum Curiosity, Nail Seonji. And he's a character from the Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s anime. I think he works for the Goha Corporation. He wants to like change Rush Duels for the better, but that also means muscling Yuga out of it. He introduces the concept of maximum summoning to Duel Links. It was kind of funny the way they went about it. Um, he's like, while we were dueling, I noticed you left space in your code for Rush Duels. Uh-huh. And so I added my own code for maximum summoning. So he made his own type of card and summoning type. And kind of just force it into <laughs> the game. Just put it into the game. Huh. <laughs> then he beats Yuga with it like, see, this is what you get. It's like, for you hacking my you code? Hack my game? And like, of course it beat me. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Yeah. But with him comes the uh, the cyber type for Rush Duels. He runs, I think, almost all cybers cards, and he brings his own maximum summon, which is going to be available in the the our, our first new like main pack uh, box, not pack, in Rush Duel Links. If this page will open, Genesis Maximum. His maximum summon's name is they covered the name. It's like Yug Drago, the Sky Emperor. Okay. And Yuga also gets his own maximum summon in that same set. If I can move these ads out of my way, Supreme Machine Magnum Overlord, and these are both. These are kind of like your typical maximum summons. They don't do a whole lot. They're protect. They're safe against traps, 
and they can get really big. That's what they do, you know? But as the idea is your opponent leaves, leaves a weak enough monster or no traps on their board. Actually, traps wouldn't even matter. You make your maximum summon, and then you swing right over their biggest or their smallest monster, and you win. Yeah. It's supposed to be just because like the OTK. difference in attack points would just mm-hmm. probably be enough to. You only have six thousand life goal. points if you've been dealing damage over the course of the game. They probably only have like four thousand, maybe only in a three thousand somewhere. I've I've been playing a new a little bit of the new event where you get to use. They give you a skill that lets you use Yuga's maximum summon monster, even though Genesis maximum is not in the game yet. Oh, it's a mini box. I just thought it. Um, you get to use the maximum summons even though we don't have them yet. And, yeah, you can deal 4,000 damage uh, kind of easily. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I I remember when they came out in Rush Duel originally. This was like a year or two ago now, it feels like. But um, the the monsters would usually complete each other's artwork. It's yeah. Kind of like a kind of full art, col- art, you know, collection of, like, art mm-hmm. cards. So. It's really neat. I saw the way that it happens in game, like in, in Duel Links and Rush Duel Links, where like just the cards literally just kind of like latch onto each other and like they're just like a block. They of even them. take the zones and squish them. Yeah, together. just until they squish together. But uh, the new pack also comes with support for other Rush Duel decks, not just the uh, these two strategies. We have uh, Harpy's Pet Dragon, so we get more Harpy support, but honestly, not that much. Uh, we get we get more fiends for the um, royal rebel strategy. We get a bunch of thunder monsters, and I have no idea what those are for. But I think they're supposed to be like a new engine that you can use. We get spell and trap remo- removal for machine decks because, like, unlike most types, they didn't have it. And a card that I'm really interested in is talismanic seal array. It's a new SR in this set, and I would read it except this ads in the way. There we go. So you shuffle four of your monsters. From your grave back into your deck. That's a, that's a normal rush duel effect. That's the requirement. The effect is one face up monster on your opponent's field loses attack equal to its level times 200 until the end of the turn. This card's actually pretty major because in, in rush duel links, you cannot, or you don't, ha- we don't have any spells that just lower a monster's attack so that you can immediately swing into them on that turn. Typically, it's through traps that you lower their attack while they swing at you. This is a very proactive and aggressive card. So I think Talismanic Seal Array is going to really help change the way we played Rush Duel Links. Yeah. You sound like a, uh, like you, it sounds like, like you're just like reading the blurb. You know, I really think it's going to change the way we play. I mean, but you're right, it actually like, will. And that's, that's just my opinion. I, th- I, I think these cards are super impactful, and I'm actually really excited for them. Just because, like I've said before, Rush Duel Links has been caveman Duel Links for, for so long. long. Time. And I I, even that, this is still kind of caveman-ish, but we're moving forward. Yeah, yeah I like that it's forward. at least like trying to move forward. Because I know for a lot of people... Rush Duel seems cool, but then you watch it and it can kind of seem like it's just get the most 1,500 attack point monsters and just kind of beat and then, like, eventually summon a level 7 that's got, like, 25 and kind of beat. And then just so this might add a little bit more depth. Yeah, it's been too simple for too long, and um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Some people are are upset that we didn't get all of the Harpy cards because in the Rush Duelings or in Rush Duels in Japan... Harpies have an entire archetype. They have they have mo- many monsters, spells, traps, and winged beast support. We didn't get all that in Duel Links. We pretty much just get the sisters and the pet dragon. But that's, and I gotta remind people, that's because there are no other archetypes in Rush Duel Links. Yeah. There are none. So it would be wild for them all of a sudden just to give you. The, the one archetype gets like, like all of it. Harpy stuff. Regina, Harpy Cielo, and all these other Harpy cards. It's like. When did we become an archetype game? Harvey Regina. What interesting. Re- yeah, they just get names. names they just get names. Because I know in the TCG, they're just like channeler or perfumer. Like they're Nope, it's Regina. Like titles. But now, <laughs> now it's just like they're people. <laughs> now there's people. Okay. Cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot to do right now. Or I want, it's not that there's a lot to do right now in Rush Duel Links. It's more so. There's more, there's to, do. more to do than we've ever had to <laughs> yeah. in Rush Duel Links. Also, I think they announced some reruns for the Mimi and Mimi event and the Roa. Uh, I forgot Roa's last name. Uh, Roa something event. Whatever. We got reruns of other events coming up. So finally, we can do things. Yeah, Duel Links is. They're moving the rush duel stuff forward, so mm-hmm. I think they need to. 
Cool. Okay. Any other uh, Yu-Gi-Oh news? I'm all Yu-Gi-Oh now. Yeah, I've really talked about Yu-Gi-Oh for a, a good bit. Um, for about an hour. Yeah. Good enough. Hit close enough. Point. So, uh, that's great. We can move on to more exciting things, maybe? I know they're exciting. Things. They're interesting. Okay. So, uh, any other card game stuff? I do have a magic story. Or it's not really a story. It's more so just kind of a, an update, an update of something. something. Okay. So, Magic the Gathering's Assassin Creed cards are up for pre-order right now. I didn't know they were doing Assassin's Creed. Yeah, who would have thought? They just cross over with everything. Maybe Magic the Gathering is like the card game Fortnite. The card game Fortnite. But even before then, you could say it's the maybe it's the card game Smash Brothers. Yeah, just everyone's here. <laughs> But uh, let's see. It says, uh, Match the Gathering's next video game crossover incorporates the world of Assassin's Creed into the card game. Like the still upcoming Fallout Magic the Gathering expansion, the Assassin's Creed set is based in the universe's beyond theme. You know, the thing that's been losing them money, but also making quite a bit of money. Oh, if, yeah, that's, that's always a conflicting story. If you're an AC fan who wants to dabble in card games or an MTG fan who wants to dabble in historical murder, you're in luck. That's a crazy sentence. Historical murder. You want to dabble in historical murder? Dabble in a little historical murder. So let me go get me a spot on the grassy note note. Um, Match the Gathering's Assassin's Creed cards are now available to pre-order at Amazon. Check here. Oh, that's a link. They come in a variety of packages and are set to release July 5th. And I'll do a quick summary of what, of because, you know, Magic can't just release one product for, like, a, an expansion. Oh, boy, let's hear it. So there'll be the MTG Assassin's Creed starter kit. That is uh, two ready to play 60 card decks, including two mythic rare cards and one learn to play guide and two boxes to store your decks. There's the Assassin's Creed Beyond Boosters. So that'll be a. Um, <coughs> it's just their normal. What are they called? The, not the. Uh, not their. Their play. Plays booster. Just play like, it's called the play booster because the, the set booster plus draft booster. Oh, combo, no. Not a play They're, booster. We're long. I have my bad. These are called Beyond Boosters. Oh. These are Beyond Boosters. They're, they, I didn't realize they had their own name. Right. Yeah, I, so I, I it's follow. seven cards in each pack, one basic land, three uncommons, one rare or mythic, one traditional foil, and one showcase uncommon rare or mythic card. But Beyond Boosters aren't where it's at. You got to get the collector boosters. Right. Now that's that's the okay. big ticket items are. Of course, of course. Got to so pay, pay old money. Every every collector's booster pack has two foil etched cards and may include a textured foil card or unique double rainbow foil serialized card. I mean, is this new those. for Assassin's Creed? Or is this how it always goes? It's sim it's always pretty similar. Okay. They love their serialized cards. Oh, there's only one hundreds of these and if you get the little number on it, it's worth more. Mm. They love to like kind of inflate the values of these cards. But so like any other Magic Gathering crossover, you can get your Assassin's Creed fix on the low. You can get it for high and uh they're offering you many ways to get it. Something I'm more so like what are the, who are the characters? I mean, I'm assuming like Ezio and characters like that. But like, I haven't seen the cards, so I don't know. Okay, so so you're just kind of giving us more of like, hey guys, pre-order it. Products are want. products are live. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know that reminds me about. Uh, it's all just I don't even have the story here. That new game. There's some like uh, people are playing more Assassin's Creed Black Flag on Steam now because oh, Ubisoft released this other like pirate Skull and Bones, game, Skull and yeah. Bones, and people don't like it. Yeah, people don't like Skull people don't like it no. much. So they're so some of them are choosing to, I guess, it reignited their interest in Assassin's Creed Four Black Flag. Skull and Bones graphically looks like a successor to Black Flag's Naval Combat, but it is. Then it misses the most the actual thing that made people like Assassin's Creed's Naval Combat. What's that? You got off the boat. So, oh, so you don't ever get off the boat? <laughs> yeah, in Skull and Bones, it's pretty much mm -hmm. an a simulated naval battle experience with some crazy fantasy esque elements, and your boats are all kind of automated with how they fire, and you so you just kind of position your boats and you just shoot things at each other. Uh, and those, you those boats like and you RTS shoot or something. Like yeah, real time it's, strategy it's, kind of. And World of Tanks. I and don't it doesn't know. really do that what very well either, because it doesn't have like the more realistic components that people like in those types of games. Okay. But the thing about Black Flag was, yeah, you had the like naval combat where the ships would fire, but then once you did enough damage, 
you aboard them and then you go into full ninja pirate mode and you're hopping around like cutting people up like that's what we liked about their naval combat we didn't love all the like all right position on the starboard side like what what direction is the wind blowing in fire like all right come on man like I mean, maybe some people are into that but I mean, it doesn't sound like many there are people who are into that but that's not what really made black flag you know it was a combination of the it was being a ninja pirate not just a pirate skull and bones says you're an automated pirate hmm well, anyway, yeah, I hope to pick up this new Universes Beyond Assassin's Creed Magic the Gathering. I product. won't. I don't think I'll actually be picking it up myself. I'm sure people like Larry or other, you know, Larry will buy pretty much any of the Magic the Gathering collabs, right? I'm just, I mean, I know he's an Assassin's Creed fan. Okay. I'm not. I played the first couple. Back on, like, Xbox 360, I played, like, one and two. Maybe two and I've, three. I've played three Assassin's Creed games, haven't finished any of them. No, four. I've never finished any of them, only because while the action is fine, I have not cared for the story. And I know that's, that's blasphemy. I don't even know what the story is. I know is. it's blasphemy, because some of y'all be telling me about these the Assassin's I Creed stories. I don't even know like, what. I didn't think <laughs> it had one. <laughs> but what? anyway. Cool. I, just could, I just could never get into the franchise. I think, But I think it's great for people who do love Assassin's Creed. I mean, Creed. That, at the end of the day, like I know I'm kind of coming across as like, oh, Paul's just like, trucking through, he doesn't care. And I don't. But... <laughs> I mean, I don't care about Assassin's Creed. I'm not saying I hate it. I just, I do not have any anything to say about it. But I will say that I think that the fact that they do so many different collabs, I'm very surprised with a new one every other week on this podcast, it seems, means that they are striking somewhere. They're striking hot for someone. Yeah, so. yeah. They, they know what demographic they're targeting, and they are going full tilt after them. I'm, I'm kind of wondering when they're going to do a Call of Duty uh, collaboration. That'd be funny. I, I don't, does Call of Duty have a story? I don't know, but they can make a Nicki Minaj card. I mean, I guess that's true. But <laughs> Twenty One Savage. Yeah, they're in Call of Duty. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, other card game news. I know that there's the Pokemon Day event, which I guess it it gets I mean, into card. It games. does get into that territory. We can't talk about Pokemon Day. Yeah. Do you have any other card game stuff for us? No. No. Okay. Let's I got do nothing. Pokemon. All right, so I pull. I have the IGN article of uh, everything announced during the uh, Pokemon Presents February 2024 edition. Yeah, I know going into that event, there was a lot of hype. It seems like the fallout of it is pop, pop, pretty positive. Well, about what I expected happened, it, before the, um, the live stream went out, someone was like, it's been leaked that the live stream is only like, only like 12 minutes and something seconds. Oh, so and then expectations started to dive, and I think we hit the like the point we were supposed to be at to begin with. Yeah, so I know there were a few major announcements. Let's hear them. All right, so for the Scarlet and Violet uh, diehards, we have new Terra Raid battles that we were like getting. A Venusaur Blastoise Charizard thing? It is the mighty Blastoise, the mighty Charizard, and the mighty Venusaur. Now, what does that mean? I think they just have good Terra types. All right. Just from the picture here, it looks like it's a ground Terra typed Venusaur. A dragon terra-typed Charizard, and I literally cannot tell what this Blastoise is. <laughs> I, the, the picture doesn't... That's I can't okay. tell. I guess you'll just get to find out when you do the raid battles, huh? Sure. Okay. I'll do them. I don't skip the raid battles. All right, moving I on. I don't know as many people are into the raid battles as they are. I hear people I talk think, about them. I think they're... Never, if you are in... You do them because it's new content. But I think because of uh, the recent snafus with the legality of having of um, people's teams in VGC events, I think you do the raid battles just to have every legal option that yeah, you can. Yeah, you don't want to miss out. Okay. Next up is uh, Pokemon Horizons. The series collaboration event starts next week in Pokemon Go. Yeah, so Pokemon Go is getting a collab with Horizons. I don't know exactly what that means. I mean, I've been watching the Horizons anime just kind of following along with it i've been mm -hmm. enjoying it really i think it debuts on netflix the next week right after too right yes i think so so it says the series kicks off on march 5 two days before pokemon horizon the series premieres in the u.s on netflix on march 11th mm -hmm. as part of the collaboration event char cadet armorug Ar armor rouge and serilege all of which were Pokemon that were originated from the Paldean region will arrive in Pokemon Go. Only those? 
Interesting. Maybe for now. Oh, yeah, probably for now. Additionally, Pikachu wearing a Caps hat. Oh, is that Captain Pikachu's hat? Will be a new yeah. costume Pokemon that will appear during the event. That's a good way to kind of promote the new anime. Get you to maybe want to watch it and stuff. Especially because like, since it's on Netflix, you'll be able to binge it. Cool. Pokemon Go is still pretty popular. It has a, a, a pr- still a pretty large install base, and they're kind of hardcore. So, hmm. Okay. Now, on to the slightly bigger announcements from it. Next up is Pokemon trading card game goes mobile. Yeah, so this is one of the ones that I was kind of interested in seeing what exactly this is. It's Pokemon TCG Pocket. Yeah, and trying to figure out what what actually is Pokemon TCG Pocket. So this game will allow you to collect virtual Pokemon cards in addition to battling with your friends. Pokemon Trading Card Game Pocket is a collaboration between the Pokemon Company, the Pokemon Trading Card Game creator Creatures Inc., and Masters EX creator D- D- DNA. I always forget how to say their name. The game is designed for those familiar with the Pokemon TCG in addition to those who love Pocket Monsters but never played. Pokemon Trading Card Game Pocket is out sometime this year on iOS and Android. My understanding of it is that it's kind of like Marvel Snap where it's going to be using a simplified rule set Mm -hmm. where it's kind of more about just how cool the cards look and not so much about like... um, it's not like a full simulator of the game. From the few screenshots I've seen, it, that does make sense. The cards fill up so much more of the screen than you'd expect for a simulator. I think it's supposed to be, because I'm like sitting here just kind of like looking at this trailer now, where it seems like it's kind of more of a, um, like it's like a low, <laughs> you just get packs and it's kind of a low effort, kind of low octane, just you can collect cards, trade them with your friends, you know, I nothing would- super involved. I think it's supposed to be a casual experience where it's like it's a social thing. Mm-hmm. So here's some of the gameplay. Wait, uh, like I'm, I'm just probably a bad thing to be there showing like in a podcast, but basically, like you know, you can trade them, you can fight with them. You, they, in, I noticed that in this tutorial, or not tutorial, but in this like promotional thing, they show a lot of people like commuting. Like on a bus, on a subway. That makes sense. You know, in places where in public transit is really popular, mobile gaming is a thing, and they want you. They're saying, "Hey, you can play Pokemon on that train ride, and you can like interact with the cards. Like you can I- explore the artwork that's inside of them. Actually, like zoom in and kind of look. Ooh. Yeah, like here. Like I'm gonna. I'll try to add some of this stuff into the uh, into the podcast as well, so that you guys can sort of see what we're seeing. It's not like Marvel oh, Snap. You can move like the cards around. Effects. And then also, like, you can... Literally, like, there's this Pikachu card, and, like, you get to, like, explore the area that it's in. Like, oh, they wow kind of for the, this. The scene. It's, like, kind of this hollow live 2.5D sort of thing, almost. Hmm. So I think that it's... <sighs> I'm not sure, actually. Like, I guess it'll take, when it comes out, like, kind of seeing it for... For what it is but i don't dislike it this feels like a marvel snap and Yu Gi Oh duel links competitor i think all three of these games exist in the same space and they, they have the same target demographic it's which is card game interested people who but they're not like they're not deep into in, the in, physical yeah. games it's very casual it's very like i said very low octane um you know you kind of you open packs, you trade, you mm-hmm. show your friends, you kind of like twist the card around and like, you know, it's like this one's cute and like you look at it and stuff. And I think that that's kind of maybe where it's supposed to stop. Now, I'm sure there will be some microtransactions. Or oh, something. I'm sure. But like, I think generally it's not meant to be a hardcore experience. And I don't dislike that. Um, however, I know that the Pokemon TCG Live app that's the new one that came out like last summer. People don't like it very much. Apparently it's kind of buggy, it's got some flaws. And I think that maybe this might feel like a slap in the face if you wanted to play proper Pokemon TCG and you've been disappointed by that app. And now they're like, okay, well, we don't care about fixing that. We're gonna release this new Marvel Snap competitor thing. It's, like maybe that's like a prettier wrong way. version. Yeah, like there's like a pretty simplified version for the casuals and the kitties. But it so, I mean, you know, who knows? Like, what when you see it, do you think this is the sort of thing that you would maybe play? Yeah. It's just a kind of a casual thing? Yeah, it looks, it looks fun. It looks, it, looks, uh, it looks interesting. 
And I I like the idea of being able to engage in card games in a more casual way where I don't have to be at a table in a sweaty card shop. Yeah. From the announcement trailer, Pokemon TCG Pocket seems to have been built in the same mold. A free-to-start game where you collect cards and challenge their players to quick and breezy battles. Um, but, you know, of course, it remains to be seen where the I'm microtransactions curious. will go. <laughs> I'm curious about microtransaction, and I'm wondering just how like quick and breezy it can really be. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, so pretty cool. And then the final announcement. And this one was the one, I think, that, that built up the most anticipation and let some people down. The new Pokemon Legends Z2A. Is that what it's called, Z2A? Yeah, or I don't know if you say Z2A or if it's ZA. Z-A or like, it's a Z and then a dash. It's when it's like A. a to Z, but it's Z to A. Yeah, I'm curious why is it Z to A and not A to Z. Who knows? I know, it, I think it's a reference to like how it's X, Y, and then Z yeah, was Z the... Yeah, Z is the green legendary the from Zygarde. Kalos, yeah. So, this game is another Legends game in the same vein as Arceus. Now, a lot of this is going to be conjecture because we have seen literally no gameplay of this. Yeah, it's just that trailer <laughs> where it's like kind of the 3D blueprint of Lumio City. Yeah. They kind of show you that there's this pro- this Lumio City project going on. I'm ass- My assumption is you're going to be there as the city is being developed into what it is during the uh, X and Y games. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, I guess, it's going to have an alternative style of playing Pokemon similar to Arceus. Though, I guess you won't be too far in the past since... Yeah, it's I feel like there's enough technological kind of know-how to do a 3D blueprint thing. So maybe this is like... I mean, the Pokemon games themselves have never been necessarily the present day. They're kind of this fantasy utopia where it could be it's, considered it's quite futuristic. Point in time. But, yeah, that's curious. And and weirdly enough, that's all we know. That's that all was you really get. Now, <laughs> that wasn't much of an announcement. Releasing in twenty twenty five, yeah, on Nintendo Switch systems. I know some people take that to mean like, is that like a soft confirmation of a Switch two? I think they're just saying that it won't be on other consoles. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have much to say because there isn't much to see. There isn't. But a Legends Arceus game, I think, is a good call. People really liked the first one, and they there were some things that people kind of wanted a little more of content-wise. Mm-hmm. So this could be their opportunity to take that and, you know, just improve on it, add things that maybe they weren't able to, like, flesh out for the first game. Yeah, I really, um, I like the idea of it because I think people people really, uh, they ragged on X and Y. And I enjoyed uh, playing Pokemon Y. So getting another shot at that region. And that lore, the mythos. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I can't lie. Yeah, I'll certainly play it. Um, I played a little bit of Legends Arceus. Wasn't able to get into it, but I have a hard time getting into a lot of games. That's something new. Um, one cool thing about this, though, and I know that the sentiment around this entire event has been like, Oh, uh, like there wasn't enough, you know, there wasn't really enough shown. It is like an anniversary event. Why do you only really have like four <laughs> announcements and no gameplay of really much of anything? And I share those sentiments for the most part. I do think this is probably the type of presentation where if it had happened in maybe like three or six more months, there could have possibly been some gameplay of this like Pokemon Legends Z game. Uh, but... I think it does show the Pokemon company is slowing down in its, like, rush to push out. Because, like, this could have been the Gen 5 remake announcement. That's what a lot of people were thinking it would be, right? Uh. Where's Pokemon Black and White, you know, X, whatever. You know, like, the the remakes, the Gen 5 remakes. Pokemon Gray. Pokemon Gray. (laughs) Um, And it could have been, like, yeah, we're remaking them. They're coming out this fall. But I think this actually shows that the Pokemon company might be doing what it is that many of us have sort of wanted them to do and slow down the game production so that the treadmill is not just cranking out, you know, a new thing every year. Because, I mean, Legends Arceus and um, Pokemon... Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl. Yeah, they came out so close. They came out within months of each other. And uh, granted, you know, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl were done by a, uh, you know, a a sort of contracted team or whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. So they weren't being developed by a lot of the, by most of the same people, but still, like, you know, there's been periods of time where it's like, man, Pokemon doesn't slow down, and nope. it almost reminds me of like the Marvel situation, where like, you know, Marvel's kind of announced that they want to release, a, you know, fewer just content pieces each year because it's kind of overwhelming people, and they're starting to perform worse. 
Pokemon's in a somewhat similar boat where it's like, you know, I'm sure they would love to have a new Pokemon thing out every single month if they could. Ooh. But, you know, also Scarlet and Violet's performance issues were really bad. And, you know, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl weren't super polished, though I did like the games myself. So maybe this is a good sign, actually. It's not so I bad. I mean, they probably want to maybe to t- take their time. Scarlet and Violet was the uh, hottest selling Pokemon games of all time. And so they're like, you know what? Let's just, like, take the foot off the gas a little bit and let's make a Pokemon game that truly deserves the title of best-selling Pokemon game of all time. Yeah, so maybe what we can expect is an announcement of Gen 5 remakes maybe next year, maybe next fall. And I'm okay with that. Take a little time. Or maybe they just won't do it. Let them cook in the oven. Yeah, or that. Because I mean, the, they never said they were working on that, right? Yeah, there's just not been be a clear. confirmation. Okay. It's just like a So assumption. many people have been talking about it. I thought maybe something got leaked. Now, I know some people were talking about maybe releasing like the Gen 3 games on the eShop, which seems like that's a low investment undertaking. So I'm surprised that they didn't announce that. But that might come later the, in the year. Hmm. So I guess it's the Pokemon news, huh? Yeah, that was Pokemon Day. We managed to talk more about it than they did on their own live stream. Okay, so I'm guessing the next few things then we'll kind of rocket through them. Not rocket through. I mean, you know, they're, they're small random stories. Yeah, that's fine. Do you have anything? Or I can no, go no, actually, that, that no, that's okay. I've got it's okay. I've got you. <laughs> we got a lightning round of interesting things. Uh, we'll start off with one that's still gaming related and kind of unfortunate. Sony announces significant PlayStation layoffs affecting 900 staff and a London studio is to close. Oh. So, yeah, about 8% of its global PlayStation workforce, that is PlayStation workforce, not Sony the company, but just the PlayStation workforce. In a blog post, outgoing Sony Interactive Entertainment boss Jim Ryan issued an update on what he called a difficult day at our company. We've made the extremely hard decision to announce our plan to commence a reduction of our overall headcount globally by about 8% or about 900 people. Mm. That's subject to local law and consultation processes. Employees across the globe, including our studios, are impacted. These are incredibly talented people who have been part of our success, and we are very grateful for their contributions. However, the industry has changed immensely, and we need to future-ready ourselves to set the business up for what lies ahead. We need to deliver on expectations from developers and gamers and continue to propel future technology in gaming. So we took a step back to ensure we are set up to continue bringing the best gaming experiences to our community. So... Uh, Ryan published an email he sent out to staff this morning and assured PlayStation gamers that, quote, our plans for reorganizing and streamlining are so we can continue to deliver the best gaming experience as possible. He says that tough decisions have become inevitable. And, um, yeah, U.S. employees will be told today if they still have a job in the U.K. where labor laws require a consultation process for mass layoffs. Sony has proposed shutting down the PlayStation London studio entirely. Woo! So, um... We need to sidestep in laws. Yeah, it's going to be rough. I mean, this sort of thing, I think, was unavoidable. And Mm -hmm. I I hate to say it about people's jobs and their livelihoods, but the gaming industry, like you said, actually has changed quite significantly since the pandemic and since the... This move towards live service gaming that everyone wants to do so badly and digital, like... Almost digital exclusive releases that they want to do. Yeah, there's a lot of people and a lot of positions within Sony and within gaming at large that don't have much of a future in the direction that they seem to want to go. Yeah, I am not an expert on you know exactly. I don't know exactly what these positions are that are being canceled, so I can't speak to like was this job necessary and mm-hmm. like all that this or that. But I will say that as someone who's kind of passively kept up with the gaming industry, it does suck to see that across the board, there's just been a lot of layoffs, a lot of cuts, entire companies closing and developers closing. Sony is not the only one. I know that it's easy to look at this headline and be like, Sony's the bad guy. They're firing a bunch of people for no reason and they're ruining their lives. And, but I mean, like just a couple weeks back, we were talking about, you know, like Riot Studios, wasn't it? Yeah. Riot, they were like laying off like 500 people. Hasbro was getting rid of... Wait, was that Bright or Blizzard? It might have been both. Might have been both. I mean, I think all these places have... There's been been a lot of layoffs. There's been a lot of stories of layoffs. You know, small indie studios, large studios. Um, I I do think COVID certainly seemed like it started the downturn, where maybe a lot of people were hired remotely, and they're finding that maybe some of those remote positions, they, they don't want to keep them anymore, or maybe it's like... 
they're trimming on like i'd love to hear because i don't know but i would love to hear what um specific areas are being impacted mm -hmm. like is it like marketing like are it's kind of like oh we don't really need these marketers is it coding is it artists you know like oh i hope designers. this is an ai motivated oh i'll be i'd be angry if this is i AI mean it might motivated. come out that it is i remember when is ubisoft who they just outright said they're like yeah we're gonna be using ai like deal with it i don't play ubisoft so, games and there's a reason why yeah so i mean you know there's things like that i would love to know like what's what sort of factors are most prioritized you know and then there's always the shareholders they're going to want better profits and more profits a great more way to now. show that you're getting more is by you fire reducing the costs of the people you have to pay so uh yeah i know that it's interesting because this actually came right after that news story like last month about how like the playstation didn't sell as many units in the last quarter or something as they anticipated mm -hmm. and and then, like, Microsoft, you know, potentially kind of not pulling out of the console business for now, but, like, kind of taking this more multi-platform approach. And things are changing yeah, in the gaming space. Rapidly. Rapidly. And I hate to see that peop you know, people lost their jobs over this. But given the, what the types of decisions that are being made in the gaming space... Our hardware is changing. Our software is changing. How we engage with the games. Yeah, it's how changing. we engage with them. Um, I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. I don't really think I I'm I don't like live service games very much. Mm -hmm. And I know I play Master Duel, hypocritical. But I'm mean, talking about just in a general sense, these live service games. I think a lot of companies are chasing the idea of having one, and we've seen some companies really fall under because their games don't turn out well or because like they'll have to like they'll release a game and it'll like end in a few months they take these uh the idea of a live service game and they release an unfinished game pro saying oh we'll just fix it later yeah we'll fix it later buy the battle pass yeah just buy the battle pass today yeah buy it now and we'll give you that feature in a few months we promise i mean because i look at uh how months Ma pass. Duel re released as a simulator basically mm-hmm and they have felt no need to actually add any more features. That would be unacceptable in like the in the gaming, broader gaming gaming space? year of yesteryear. Yeah, but yeah. Nowadays, games release as just that, just like a bare bones. Sometimes, game. sometimes you get a bare bones game, and they still want you to buy that battle pass day mm -hmm. one because they're trying to offer. I know what it is. They want to offer you the zero dollars and zero cents buy in, where it's yep. like it's free to start, and now you can start for free and tell all your friends. Hey, let's play this little like multiplayer looter shooter or team shooter or battle royale or whatever together, and no, and there's no commitment because you can always get your friends to just download it. They don't have to pay anything. And if they they can show that they have an install base and they have users and they then, have revenue coming in, then they're like, oh, we can invest okay, money now in this now. Invest. But then it's like when they don't invest, and for the people who did take a chance on it early, they really get burned for it. Mm -hmm. So. They don't, they're just trying to avoid that the old thing of you invest like your millions of dollars into a bad game idea. It comes out and no one plays it, so you lost all that money. At least with live service, if you, you invest as little money in your game as possible, and if no one likes it, you only lose that. Yeah. really sucks. But I'll tell you what doesn't suck. What? Did you know that you can smell your video games now? Have you ever uh, wanted to smell your video games? One smelling? time, my PlayStation was kind of overheating, and it was burning You smelled something. your video game then, huh? I, I smelled something there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, listen. Here's something that'll blow your nostrils off. So, video game worlds are expensive places with lots of sights and sounds. With the advent of virtual reality, you can almost touch the environment you're inhabiting. But scent has been one of the senses that gaming technology can never quite get right. I mean, who wants to smell Ganondorf or Link when they probably smell like shit? Wow, that that's such a, a leading statement. I imagine there's a lot of people who feel differently. <laughs> that's true, actually. <laughs> there's some sick people out here, man. I want to smell Ganondorf's musk. <laughs> well, thankfully, you won't have to catch a whiff of their BO, but a new device promises to open your nostrils to the aromas of the video game world. GameScent is a new device by a tech company of the same name that sounds kind of goofy. It's powered by AI, your favorite. The $180 ca adapter captures real-time audio and processes those sounds to emit scents that correspond with the on-screen action. 
So if you're playing something like 2022's stylish racing game Need for Speed Unbound, you'll choke on, I mean smell, <laughs> the car's exhaust when burning out in drifting corners. The same is true of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Just plug the game scent into your console, PC, or TV's HDMI port, breathe in, and let me know what Mako smells like. It's smell vision but for games. Oh, so, smell a vision uh, It's a pretty big box. It's 18 by 16 by 12 inches. Uh, and here is how it looks. It's just this box. Oh. Okay. Sophisticated AI releases real sense alongside your gameplay. You can smell gunfire, explosions, <laughs> racing, storm, forest, and um, there's also, I mean, this might be just someone just joking on Twitter. I would hope so. Oh, no, this is from Jeff Keeley. Okay, so, so upgraded DLC sense include Nepalm, Human Exertion, Ocean, and Golf Course. Okay, so, it's so this, I'm gonna put up a picture, but it's just this big all right. box. Okay, so let me paint a picture uh, that you might one day be able to smell. So in Cyberpunk 2077, there yeah. is a mission where you, you and your, um, let's say your close friend Pan Am, have just finished fighting off a bunch of uh, robots or tanks inside of this like tank that you are both cybernetically connected to and then you both engage in what can only be described as cyberpunk coitus inside the tank okay. all right when they say human exertion will i be able to smell what the inside of that tank smells like You're during smell that scene the sex effectively is I mean, in a press release, GameSent president Casey Bunch said the device is fully compatible with consoles, PC, and VR headsets, if you really want to get immersed, specifying that the company wants to elevate the gaming experience. Quote, studies have shown that the sense of smell imprints in long-term memory more strongly than anything else, Alec. Uh, with GameSent, we're hoping to elevate gamers' experiences to be more exciting and memorable than they've ever been before. So in the mission, there's a mission in Cyberpunk where you're, you're, you're raiding this club called Clouds, and it has it has uh, it's a, it's a club. What will I be able to smell like the sweat and the liquor in the air? And when the gunfire sm starts, am I gonna smell the like the gunpowder? And okay, I'm gonna be honest about this. How is it doing this? I don't know. Like, I'm so confused. That, that's actually what I'm more curious. Like, <laughs> like I'm sitting here, you know, I'm acting coy about the whole thing. How? What? How does this work? Because all we have is this image, and I don't think that you can really. I mean, a video probably wouldn't really do it justice. Because like, like, w it, it, does this mean that you have to like fill it up with some fluids or something that it kind of just like. Yeah, like how is it making out? a smell? Like, and what's it how doing? does it customize smells? Because environments in gaming can be so complex. If I'm having a gunfight on a tropical beach, am I going to smell the beach and the gunpowder? Yeah. That's so... Like, if I'm in a cedar forest, they're going to give me, like, the like the like that kind of piney scent. It feels like a joke. Like... It does feel... It is it like April Fool's yet? It's not April Fool's okay, yet, Okay, just checking. So if you want it, you can get it from some of the usual retailers. Amazon, Best Buy, and GameStop. Uh, if I play, okay, oh, it uses cartridges, so you oh. have to swap in and out cartridges okay. that will have different scents. I'm actually going on this website right now. You have to provide, so you have to buy cartridges to use in the thing. Okay, buy a kit for one hundred forty nine ninety nine, save thirty dollars, and get six full scent cartridges. Do you want to purchase this and do a video on it just for fun? We won't do it on like the main. We might. This could be fun. Sure. I, I might buy this. Sure. But I'm scared if we play that game stray, am I gonna smell cat litter and like alleyways? I'm just so I I there's I have so many questions and I just don't I don't know. But you know what? I wanna get one now, order one and just smell my game. There's so many things I can think of that I just wouldn't want to smell. There are so many games. Can you imagine what Street Fighter would smell like? Oh, yuck. Or, or maybe it's good. It's, it's just maybe like lots want, like, the, of the sweat. sweat just just to, lots. Of, and and like, a lot of it, too. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would love to smell like Chun-Li's sweat. Oh, so. my gosh. 
I'm going to tell you guys right now, Chun Li's sm- sweat smells like everyone else's sweat. But the value of it, though. The fuck, the value, my God. Or reuse sweat. Reuse sweat smells like everyone else's sweat. You don't know that. The Street Fighter developers might disagree. I do wonder, though, like how this interprets, like what. I mean, it can. Obviously, the sound of gunfire in like a shooting game. I got. Yeah, I get how you could kind of just turn. Oh, okay, it's like gunfire here. We can admit that. But like, how is it emitting like human exertion? Does it hear moans or grunts? Like what? <laughs> You know, I would love to hear that. I'm so horrified about sex scenes in video games. Yeah, they're about like, to take on a new. You about to, you 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 gonna smell the stank and that that's crazy. Well, anywho, I like to think that in every podcast that we do, there's always going to be at least one story that really kind of brings people out of the woodwork with opinions. Oh and no! I think this next one's going to be it. What did you? Find? Well, don't worry, it's not political per se, but um, Nintendo is suing the makers of open source Switch emulator Yuzu. I don't know so what it is. I did not know very much about this, but um, basically, new, Nintendo is suing the makers of Yuzu, which is an open source Nintendo Switch emulator, mm-hmm. according to a lawsuit filed in Rhode Island court on Monday. So the 41 page lawsuit was filed against Tropic Haze, which is the company that makes Yuzu. Um, it's a free emulator that was released in 2018, months after the Nintendo Switch originally launched. Um, the same folks who made Citra, which is a Nintendo 3DS emulator, also made this one. Basically, it's a piece of software that lets people play Nintendo Switch games on Windows PC, Linux, and Android, Android devices. It also runs on Steam Deck, um, which Valve actually showed and then wiped in a Steam Deck video clip. Ah. Emulators <laughs> aren't necessarily illegal, but pirating games to play on them is. But Nintendo said in its lawsuit that there's no way to legally use Yuzu. Hmm. Nintendo argued that Yuzu executes codes that defeat Nintendo's security measures, including decryption using an illegally obtained copy of prod keys, product keys. Um, in other words, without Yuzu's decryption of Nintendo's encryption, unauthorized copies of games could not be played on PC or Android devices, Nintendo wrote in the lawsuit. As to the alleged damages created by Yuzu, Nintendo pointed to the release of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which leaked almost two weeks earlier than the game's May 12th release date. I did hear about that. The pirated version of the game spread quickly. Nintendo said it was downloaded more than one million times before Tears of the Kingdom's release date, and people used Yuzu to play the game. Nintendo said that more than 20% of download links pointed people to Yuzu. So though Yuzu doesn't give out pirated copies of games, Nintendo repeatedly said that most ROM sites point people towards Yuzu to play whatever games they've downloaded. Oh, they seeking damages, damages. They gonna, those people are going to go bankrupt. There's more. Nintendo said it's expended uh, significant resources to stop the illegal copying, marketing, sale, and distribution of its Nintendo Switch games. It says that Yuzu earns the team $30,000 per month on its Patreon from more than 7,000 patrons. And Nintendo said the company has earned at least $50,000 in paid Yuzu downloads. Nintendo said that Yuzu's Patreon doubled its paid members in the period between May 1st and May 12th when Tears of the Kingdom was released. So Nintendo is asking the court to shut down the emulator and for damages. Mm. So. That's tough. Oh, This is going to get rough. Here's where the fun kicks in. Uh, is the fun gray area of piracy and emulation with these video games. Uh, so, I don't know. Thoughts? Merge your head, go to first. I mean, on the surface, and they kind of already debunked that, and, and with their with their argument, you know, the emulators aren't the illegal part, it's the ROMs themselves that are illegal. But Nintendo alleges that the emulator itself is illegal. Now, in in cases like that, their right to then, if they can prove that the, uh, what's it called, Yuzu emulator is actually uh, running some, like, illegal codes or whatever. I didn't quite understand all of that nonsense. But if they can prove that the Yuzu emulator is the problem and should not be allowed, then they could argue that any profits the Yuzu emulator has made was at the expense of the Nintendo, Nintendo Switch. Yeah. They could go for they could go for everything. Yeah. And more. So I think um, you know, obviously emulation software itself is 
as it stands, at least to my understanding, is not illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not an expert. Consult your local lawyer or something. I don't know. There's but, somebody in this comment section that is, I'm yeah, sure. Someone I'm sure is an expert. Everyone likes to think they are anyway. But I'm sure someone actually is. And, um, you know, I know that the emulation software is not illegal, but the ROM, but acquiring the ROMs if you have not purchased the game is. Right. And anybody can claim that the ROMs that they downloaded are fine because, well, I, I bought it. And no one's going to, like, check you on that. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you can download all the ROMs you want and just claim that you own a copy of the I know a game. guy that has um, many ROMs, and uh, he, he, he hasn't owned any of the games. He's got ROMs, too. Right. So, um, you know, this one's going to be an interesting one. I know that because Yuzu does make money on Patreon, there is also, like, like it'd be different if it was, like, a free, just totally free right. like thing, and they're not getting any profits from it. But I guess their profits are coming from... The fact that they provide this tool that lets you emulate these games. I don't know if I have a side I'm on in this one. Like this one just it just feels very complicated. I know Nintendo's a you know, they're kind of known as being a bit of a bully. They shut down fan games, they've gone after emulators and stuff in the past. So people are inclined to be against them. But frankly, as someone who is not, you know, I don't like pirate switch games. So, uh, you know, it, it, I don't have like, a, I don't think I have a dog in this fight. I'm not about to sit here and defend the multi like billion dollar company because they're like my, my I'm, I'm their number one customer. I'm really not. Hey, I hear you, Paul. I also have never uh, emulated a Switch game. Me neither. Like, <laughs> okay. Like, in fact, I, I don't know anyone who ever has. No one in my circle. Like, we just don't right, do that. Yeah. Well,. Uh, I would like to hear people's thoughts on this. I feel like this will probably be one of those ones where there's a little bit more, uh, a little, a little back and forth, a little back on and it. forth on it. Because, like, as I've gotten older, my views towards stuff like you know piracy and emulation have changed somewhat. Become more conservative. Um, that's a way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like. I don't know. I think as a kid, as a teenager, you know, getting into like the early YouTube stuff, I think everybody dabbled in like. You know, cracked video editor program mm-hmm. and like all these things. How do you download a free Photoshop or something? But um, nowadays, I mean, I just, you know, I pay for things. I don't really mind it. But I also realize that everyone's situations are a little different. People's locations are a little bit different. You might not have access to media or things. There's also this whole conversation around like preservation of physical media as as a thing that's sort of going away where it's like, okay, when this game is off whatever eShop digital store, mm. it's no longer around period. Like you can't access it. So some people view that as maybe a reason why they should compile I mean, all this stuff. There is and- a difference between preservation and piracy. When my friend wants to watch the latest boxing matches, uh, he's just preserving them. Uh, you know, he's preserving them in his memory. That, that's mm. what that's what he does. Well, at any rate, it, it's also for free, right? So, I'm surprised to know. I mean, I guess Nintendo in the past has gone after more like of the the, the pirated game sites more so than the software. Uh, Nintendo won several lawsuits targeting game sites like ROM Universe, where it was awarded more than two million in damages. I think it's just hard. I think it's hard to nail down. Who you're suing? Because like I want to sue this website. All right, who owns it? Somebody somewhere in some. I mean, they country. can get like the site or the program taken down, but there can always be another emulator. Mm-hmm. And I guess what I, Nintendo would probably ideally want is for the ROMs themselves to never be able to be distributed. But the nature of how games works is that like someone can always get someone them. Someone can always can. So. Um, and I know with uh, game these gaming companies, they do put in some effort to try and make their games quote unquote unpiratable. Yeah, that has never worked. Lots of security it has keys never and worked. Stuff. I mean, it's it's always it's like that typical. Like we're all, it's going to be like a circle. Like you know, the mm-hmm. company innovates in a way of encrypting games. <clears throat> Hackers or tinkerers, we'll call them. You know, They'll will crack find it. ways to crack that, and then it kind of repeats and it runs in a circle. So. Um, I wonder what the precedent will be if Nintendo wins this case. Because, like, if they win a case against Yuzu, my assumption would then be, like, well, n- 
does that just mean like no emulation software for a Nintendo consoles can ever exist? That's what they would like. At least legally. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'll be following it. I'm sure we won't get a verdict until like next year or something. So it'll be a bloody and hard fought battle. But I'll tell you one thing. What? That one guy uh, that they Gary Bowser who got arrested like last year mm-hmm. for selling Switch hacks. He still owes Nintendo ten million dollars. Um, he paid Nintendo one hundred and seventy five million or one hundred and seventy five not million, but one hundred and seventy five dollars while in prison from money that he earned <laughs> in the prison library and kitchen. Oh, gee. So imagine being so indebted to Nintendo that even while you're in prison, they're making you work to get the money. So, like, you literally have to wash dishes. He'll never make that money. It just won't happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe we should just get back to smelling our video game characters' musk as they fight in combat or have intercourse. Oh, jeez. Well, that's all right. I've got more fun rapid-fire stories. These are not gaming or anything related. Let's them eat flakes. Kellogg's CEO says poor families should consider cereal for dinner. Cereal for dinner. How do they figure? Yeah, so the multimillionaire chief executive officer of the U.S. food processing giant Kellogg's has drawn scorn from some quarters after, (laughs) what a fun way to word that, after recently suggesting that families with strained finances could cope by eating cereal for dinner. That's crazy, because there's families that actually do that. (laughs) Yeah, uh, so he was speaking live on CNBC's Squawk on the Street on February 21st when he delivered the remarks in question, which some have compared to the let them eat cake phrase frequently attributed without evidence to Marie Antoinette before execution during the French Revolution. Anyways, he says, The cereal category has always been quite affordable, and it tends to be a great destination when consumers are under pressure. Um, he said amidst a discussion about high grocery prices, If you think about the cost of cereal for a family versus what they might otherwise do, that's going to be much more affordable. He doubled down. Saying that, um, oh, well, first I should probably say, uh, the CNBC host Carl asked Pilnick, whose company's brands include Frosted Flakes, Fruit Loops, Corn Pops, and Rice Krispies, whether his remarks could land the wrong way with consumers who have been forced to spend about 26 to 28% more on groceries in general since 2020. Which, by the way, I can attest to this. Like, I. Paul when buys I'm, a lot of cereal. When I'm. When I'm well, just cereal in general has gone up. It's rare to find, like, a box of cereal for. Anything less than four dollars, tough to find for less than five. Um, yeah, so Pilnick doubled down, saying, "In fact, it's landing really well right now. Cereal for dinner is something that is probably more on trend now, and we could expect that to continue as that consumer is under pressure." Wow, they say y'all po. They say y'all po and can't afford real food. Y'all eating y'all eat like Cheerios Pokemon. for dinner. If you're a broke boy, just say it. <laughs> eat your Cheerios say for dinner. That. Eat, eat them, eat them, and shut up. Like, is that does that mean Kell- Kellogg's gonna release a line of uh, dinner cereals like <laughs> beef stroganoff Cheerios? <laughs> yeah, that like, you know, I wonder <laughs> Frosted Flakes spaghetti. I wonder if this Pilnick guy does he like feed his kids cereal for dinner? No, he loves his kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I I think... They probably don't eat cereal for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like I said, the price of cereal is pretty high. Like, four to five bucks is the bare minimum you can really expect to pay. Like, for, like, small boxes, and at Mm. least in, like, kind of our area. For some people, like, the family size box is, like... Eight, nine, ten bucks for Which some cereal. Which is technically cereals. cheaper than what you spend at like McDonald's or Burger King or something. So I mean, like maybe in the year three dollar carton of milk. Oh <laughs> my god! You get your uh, <laughs> turkey with gravy, uh, frosted Ugh. flakes. You know, it's, oh, don't, don't worry. It t- t- tastes just like the real thing. Just put instead of milk, use gravy. Yuck! Yeah. So. Mm. Well. Um, are you going to be living in this dystopian hellscape, Alec? No, I don't, I don't really like cereal like that. Yeah, well, uh, according to this guy, you might not have a choice soon. It's, 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 it's an interesting kind of thing where when I zoom out from the jokes and the memes of it, I get what he's saying, sort of, 
where it's like, hey, if you are on rough times, then you should find affordable eating options, and this could be one. Mm -hmm. There's nothing untrue about what he's saying. I think the problem is just that, like, A, it's coming from a, you know, a billionaire, billionaire CEO, and then B, he's only saying that because that would be to his benefit. Yeah. Like, it's just... You know, if you please buy more cereal instead of going to McDonald's or instead of buying some for other frozen food or whatever, you know. Now, if he was the CEO of a company that produces eggs, then. Yeah. That like, might oh, OK. Different. All right. So but, yeah, he, may, he has a point then. So. <sighs> let him eat cereal. Yeah. Let them eat flakes. So, yeah, that's a fun one. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think. You buying more cereal for dinner, guys? And what kind of cereal you buying what kind of for cereal? dinner? As a kid, I used to eat a lot of, like, cereal for dinner. I mean, yeah, kids but, do like, that. But, like, I was, like, my parents didn't want me doing that. I mean, uh, yeah. Like, like, they'd be like, eat your actual dinner, like, please. And like, like, cere- But we yes. got Reese's Puffs in the cabinet. Like, why would I? Cereal as a snack <laughs> is cool, though, so. See, I, man, I used to take the little bag of cereal to school, the little in the Ziploc bag. I used really? to eat that. You had cereal in a Ziploc bag? Yeah, it was, we support in a Ziploc bag and take it to school with us. I never did that. Although my school did have... Did you trying to call me poor? All right, no, no, look, no, no, we're going to no, take no, this no. outside. No, no, I've done some poor... I, which is I, actually I, more inside, but the outside's actually that way. Yeah, listen, I... I have lived the poor life, I can say <laughs> that. So... You know, that's not a knock on anyone who has. I've, I've been there. I mean, we even pour milk in the Ziploc. No, we didn't do so that. We I didn't. know what, what that's about. Uh, I, I remember at my school we had the, uh, the, the like, little small, like, kind of just plastic thing of cereal. That, like, had, like, oh, a, yeah. you peeled off. Everybody mm-hmm. had that. Yeah, though, we I had guess. those. Yeah. Okay. I, I, that's where I learned to like those... Um, the square... Oh, what were they called? Not grams. Why were they like grams? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Golden grams. Golden, Golden grams. grams. That's yeah. where I like to. That's yeah. where I learned to like them. I mm-hmm. never saw them in store. I didn't know what those were, but we got them yeah, in school. Yeah, those would be very common in those school mm-hmm. things. Anywho, well, listen. If you were uh, worried about the price of food, then you'll be happy to know that Wendy's is planning an Uber style surge pricing, where burger prices fluctuate based on demand. So, as you might know, whenever you, you know, call for an Uber, the price that you'll pay is based on how busy things are at the time. Yeah. Well, anywho, when he's just preparing to test an Uber-style surge pricing model where prices will fluctuate throughout the day based on demand, meaning a Dave's Burger will cost more during the lunchtime rush. Wait, what is a Dave's Burger? That's just what they say in the article. I don't even know what that is. is that like okay, a type I don't know of, what that is either. I think it's a thing on their menu. Uh, I've never heard of it. I've eaten Wendy's quite a bit. Well, anyways, Wendy's CEO, Kirk Tanner, who rose to the chief role earlier this month, announced the new system on a call with investors, noting that the pricing menu will begin testing in 2025. With the dynamic pricing model, the chain's iconic Dave's Single. So I guess that is what it's called. Iconic? I've yeah, never heard of it. Yeah, not so this. iconic that I knew about it, but could increase by as much as $1 at lunchtime. And drop down by the same amount after the lunch rush. With constant pricing shifts, Wendy's will rely on digital menu boards. So, yeah, basically, you know, if you want to get your food when it's like the lunchtime rush or the dinner rush or whatever, you're going to pay a little more. But I guess if you're willing to wait until maybe like, let's say, 3 o'clock after the lunch rush, 3 or 4, maybe you'll get a discount on your burger. Sound good? I don't know, Paul. Something don't sound right about that. Yeah, I like, don't like the sound. I think of that. somebody needs to look into this because I don't even know if this is legal. It feels like it should. I mean, if Uber it is legal, it, right? it feels like it shouldn't be legal. This is not a service, though. This is like this is food. Like I don't love the idea. What of is this no. gas? Like I don't love the idea of it, where it's kind of like you know supply and demand. What? Well, so here's the way that here's there's a lot of reasons why it's not great, but. I think that the main thing that I worry about is what I think about with, like, inflation and stuff, where it's like, okay, let's say the cost of this burger is, like, $4. This Dave's single. Let's say it's, like, 4 bucks. During the lunchtime rush, in this new system, during the lunchtime rush, it might be, like, 5 bucks. Mm-hmm. But it's okay, because if you don't get it during lunch, it'll be less. You'll just be hungry. But here's the thing. When it's less, it's still got maybe, let's say, a floor of, like, three fifty. But when it's in demand, it can be as high as, like, five fifty. Right. So even though it sounds like, well, you know, it just fluctuates. No, what it really is, it's just on average going to be more. 
and it's just right. and we're kind of explaining it away with this whole yeah, like I don't like this one. Yeah, you, know, you well you bought it when it was in demand. So yeah, I, I don't like the sound of that. Nah, I, I think food pricing should be static. It should change like it should change like in the general way that food pricing might change. But not but in this not very like, like, hour to hour thing. I don't like that's, that. that. That's rough. I don't like I don't, it one bit. Well, it's okay because if this goes well, then all food places probably, fast food and eventually all food will Look, likely. I'm, you can, I'm going to go ahead and put this on record. Uh, if, you, if a Wendy's catches on fire nearby me and they implement this, I did it. The price of Wendy's quarter pound cheeseburger already differs depending on your location. For reference, the fast food chain's Newark, New Jersey location charges five ninety nine for the uh, Dave single, where while at an outpost in Times Square, a Dave single is eight nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> God, I'm so glad I don't live in freaking New York. Jesus, eight for a Dave single. I don't know what that is, but I, I, it's not worth eight bucks. I'm telling you right now. The dynamic pricing model: New Yorkers could expect to shell out nearly ten dollars for a cheeseburger at lunchtime. And that's not including a drink or fries. Look, maybe, man. Look, I'm telling you, we're gonna start. We're gonna start burning these Wendy's down. Keep playing with us. Uh, I no comment. But yeah, so that's gonna be fun. Mm-hmm. I hope that you enjoy paying a lot for food because you can expect to pay a little bit more. I think it's time I, to do some pot. Before then, y'all need to rise up and fight these corporations. They doing too much. Well, we won't be able to fight them if we're hungry. So <gasps> that's the strategy. Yeah, so that that's how they keep us down. They keep us hungry because you can't find an empty stomach. And well, but you can fight on pot. Okay, I guess you know. Now that I think about it, the difference is: do you pay like ten bucks for your Wendy's burger, or do you eat on a budget with your Kellogg cereal? Oh man, the cereal sounded pretty good right now. Yeah, see, lie. like they have one, a point. I mean, the sound well, like, the one of them trying to save us money, the other ones just trying to something. All right, what we got here? So is it worth it to buy cards for a TCG you don't have a locals and don't have friends to play with? So if you don't have a locals and don't have friends to play with, is it still worth it to buy cards? Gut reaction is to remind you guys that if you want to ever leave a question in the pot of greed, you can always use the link in the description. Now my answer to the actual question. Yeah. You got to really love it to do that. I think... I, like, there is merit to being a collector of a TCG and not a player. Yeah, like if this person is talking about like, do you, if you just want to collect the cards, then whether or not you have a store or whatever probably doesn't change that very much. Mm-hmm. Like collecting them just to display or kind of just have to yourself or whatever. Cool. However, I I mean I'm already a, a pretty strong proponent in the Yu Gi Oh space of. Um, don't feel pressured to buy cards unless you are like traveling to regionals and YCS events every weekend. Like, there's no reason to spend a hundred bucks on a little night, a bonfire, a wanted, any of those other cards. Like, this like thousand dollar deck cores if you only play at locals. Yeah, if like, you're not gonna really, not really put them to use. It. But like, if you are, you know, going to every YCS, you're hitting up the circuit, and this will increase your chances of winning. Then. Maybe you can consider it, right? Like it might be that price of entry might be worth it for you, right? But this is like the even more extreme version of the question, where it's like, I mean, if you don't even have anyone to play with, I I have a hard time justifying spending much money. I don't know this person's financial situation. Let me see your pockets. So you know, I can't speak to like I, I would like to give like an amount or something like oh well. You know, if you don't have a locals, maybe it's okay to like spend a few bucks on cards, or maybe you mm. can spend a, like less than a hundred dollars in a deck. But I found more and more so that even just the definition of what is budget and stuff is highly, you highly really be sure. relative to. What about you? I mean, if you just didn't have a local scene and you didn't have friends, like you're living alone and it's a kind of remote, just are you buying cards or no? Yeah, you are going to buy them. I mean, I, I collect cards. I buy cards for card games I never play. So you, so you do it just. To collect, yeah, but not with the intention of playing. Yep. Okay, that's cool. I, I mean, I'll say this: when I was a kid, there were people at school who like played Yu-Gi-Oh, but I feel like I didn't really buy cards, knowing that I would have people at school or friends to play with. I think I just kind of got them. You got them, got them. You got them to get them. You got them to get them. So, um, yeah, I think to answer the question, I would say it's fine to buy them. It sounds like this person probably already does buy them. I guess. 
So it sounds like they're already got one foot in anyway. Might as well keep going. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but my general advice to people though is, you know, don't go spending the big bucks. Yeah, the game can get a little expensive, so yeah, don't uh, <laughs> go spend the big bucks. Cool. Uh, my question: Should Konami include digital rewards when purchasing physical products? Like how Pokemon and apparently MTG do. Okay. Like when you buy the Pokemon pack, I guess, like you get the little you code get the, for Pokemon. Yeah, for the online. pack in the same. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. You think Konami should be doing that? I actually, I think that would be cool. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a cool thing for Konami to do. Would Konami ever do it? No, well, that's not I don't. the question. Uh, Let, let's okay. Let's we'll, think about we'll, the fun. We'll positive stay within the scope of the question. The scope of realism. I think they should only because that just gives people more reason to buy a seal product. I think it would just keep people in the funnel. Yeah, yeah, because it's like you buy your physical pack and now you have a reason to try out Master Duel. I don't see a downside to it other than maybe for Konami they don't want people to like. Well, actually, before I get into that. Masterville's card pool is not the same as, like, the TCGs. Yeah. So, since it's always, like, behind and all that, it might, that might be... Maybe it's a Master Pack. That's probably what they would do. Yeah. They just, you just get to open a Master get Pack. Get a Master Pack. You buy a pack, get a Master Pack. Which still wouldn't be the worst thing. Yeah, it's not the worst, like, value transaction. Like, you, you're, you're buying a pack for physical cards, and the digital is just a bonus. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed. I, I, I don't know how the hell things work at Konami. But I will say that uh, this is something that people were talking about even like right when Master Duel had been announced, like before it was out. They were like, mm-hmm. you know, are we? How are we going to pay for the cards? Is it going to be like a gotcha? Is it going to be a subscription? Is it going to be like you buy a physical cards and then you redeem the rewards? We, as we we know now, it's basically just kind of a free to play gotcha system or whatever, with with a crafting thing. It's fine, but I would not mind the alternative of also buying cards at Walmart and getting. And I think that'll just bring more people to Master Duel, which is a good thing. Yeah, I would say it's a good thing. Sounds like Konami, though, according to those shareholders last year, they're having some difficulties transitioning people from Master Duel to physical. And when I think about it that way, I guess that's what they would prefer to do. Is they prefer that you kind of play some Master Duel, but also play some physical, because physical is more guaranteed money for them, I guess. I think the opinion. margins on physical Yu-Gi-Oh! are just huge. I, I think, I mean, when you think about the end of the day, they're manufacturing on paper. Yeah. And paper that we value quite highly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, cool. I, I'm I'm team do the digital reward code stuff. Same. All right. So, okay. Advice for joining a, a local scene. I play a lot of Duel Links and get all my physical cards on Amazon. So, this is a person who they don't play physical Yu-Gi-Oh with People. This is a great segue from the last question. Right? It's like it's, the same kind of topic. Yeah, we're still in the same like, like wheelhouse here. So they want to move. They want to move into playing regularly at locals. Yeah. But the only regular Yu Gi Oh they play is Duel Links, and while mm-hmm. they have physical cards, they've really they've not dealt with a card shop before. Interesting. Well, listen up, Konami. We're about to do your job for you. Here so we go. Let's, Putting, let's, let's put let's let's put Yu Gi Oh on our backs again. Yeah, let's <laughs> sell Yu Gi Oh to someone here. No, only kidding. Um, sort of. But this person plays Duel Links. They want to get into locals. I think the the most important thing is networking. I guess the number one thing. You show up to the card shop. You want to actually like talk to the people working there and let them know that you are like new to the like to this shop in this area and you want to get into Yu Gi Oh. You don't know much about it and see what resources they offer you to like help you get into the game. Right? Will they? Because they might be able to point you to the direction of a Yu Gi Oh player who can make it easier for you. Maybe they play Yu-Gi-Oh and then they can get you on the discord and whatnot. Like a hundred percent. I think that's a great one. I think not enough people kind of take advantage of the fact that like, you know, the card shop owners and stuff like they'll usually want to help you out and they'll usually know who's best for maybe like teaching, maybe what products they might recommend. Um, well, I'd be a little careful with letting the card shop owners recommend products. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, use your best judgment, but typically, I mean, you know, you were probably already considering buying at least, like, structured decks or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think just, like you were saying, networking, kind of just be friendly, get to know people. Don't take anything too seriously. Like, 
you don't ha- you don't have to do anything your first trip to a show. You don't even you don't have to play. You don't, you don't have, have to play buy the tournament. Anything. You don't have to buy any things. It's it might just be a good to kind of just observe and kind of see what what's the vibe at this card shop. Some card shops are really sweaty and try hard. Mm-hmm. Some are really chill and casual, and then everything in between. You can see kind of what sort of stuff the stock the shops got in stock. Do they sell like singles or whatever? How are you know what are people kind of just talking about and. Just take it all in. Maybe the first trip. Don't yeah. don't. You don't have to like make do a decision anything. Just at like, all. Call it a fact finding mission. Like when are the tournaments? Yes. Yeah, so when do shopping. they usually have the Yu Gi Oh meetups? Because it's not always every day. Some shops every day, but for most shops, I think you know the Yu Gi Oh Yu Gi Oh will meet up like once or twice a week. Now, more concretely, I would say that pretty much any deck that you're playing in Duel Links likely exists in some playable fashion in the TCG. So if you're playing like you know evil twins and duel links, right? I know that's yeah, not it's one very not. very you transitional. You can also just try to build a an evil twins deck in the TCG, and it's totally like functional, playable yep. deck, and it's fine. So that might make the actual like card game transition pretty painless. Though I would caution you against building Tachyon in the physical game, if if you know if that's what you're thinking. Yeah, that's what you're playing. <laughs> I mean, it's a, but even like Galaxy Photon is actually a decent. I mean, it is serviceable. Game, it so. is a serviceable de- serviceable deck. So yeah, I would say that um, just don't you know? There's no pressure. Take it slow. Take it easy. It's not you know. No one can make you buy anything, play mm-hmm. anything, whatever. And just kind of network here. People have to say, Yu Gi Oh players are in this weird camp where they're. We were having this conversation just the other day. Yu Gi Oh players are just gamers. Like yeah, in all the good and the bad ways. People are what you expect from gamers. They can be a little over competitive and like kind of snobbish about it, or they can be you'll find slobs and things like that. But also, no one's actually all that mean either. Like they just like mm-hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh. More than anything, Yu-Gi-Oh players like to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh and yep. play Yu-Gi-Oh. So when you look at it that way, it's like no one in that shop, at least of the Yu-Gi-Oh playing community, is that much different than you. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. like. If you were to just walk in and say the word "ash blossom and joyous spring," someone will have an opinion, well, that, and then you will they, suddenly have. That's a not in dual links. They'd probably say "dd crow." Yeah, I mean, they would have an <laughs> opinion, like, and suddenly you can have a conversation. So, I guess no pressure is, is kind of the yeah would be my I thing. See. Just you know, just, just slide on in and see what happens. You never know. Okay. Um, final question comes from Basic Nerd. He actually. I guess signature to his question. Yes. His or her. Preferred sleeves and deck box for tournaments. Funny that you mentioned this. I actually made a short <laughs> about this like last night. Um, so. I like dragon shields. Yeah. For sleeves, dragon shield for sure is kind of been my go-to. However, I will always tell people that value to money I think Ultra Pro is actually probably better. They do cost significantly less. Yeah, because Ultra Pro sleeves are like three or four bucks. And while they're not as well made or maybe, you know, have as great a color selection, it's three or four bucks versus Dragon mm-hmm. Shields like, you know, eight, nine. Just make sure you get the kind that have the uh, the black inside so your card doesn't bleed through the back of the sleeve. Yeah, that's the one thing I would definitely say is that's um, for Ultra Pro, that's called Eclipse. Yeah, and okay, for yeah, Dragon Eclipse. Shield, that's dual matte. As for deck boxes, I don't have one right next to me at the moment, but I like the Ultimate Guard Sidewinder boxes. Mm. Um, They're just small, single deck boxes. They hold yeah. up to... I've got one of that. Could you grab that? Was it 60 cards? There? The blue one, yeah. Oh, these, yeah, they hold like... Okay, so here it is. Um, hopefully you guys can like see this. It's the Ultimate Guard Sidewinder. It opens up, and for Yu-Gi-Oh decks, this is perfect. I've got my deck... Extra deck, side deck, all in here. Um, they all fit really well. I like these for tournaments because they're small and easy to carry around, kind of throw in a bag or whatever. They're well built, Ultimate Guard. Um, pay me for saying that if you want. But no, seriously, I like these. Um, some people like these larger boxes where like it can hold a lot more. You can hold like field centers and tokens, yeah. and like they have these like compartments for. For, like, dice and stuff and dividers and all these things. Yeah, flip trays. Which, these are fine, too. This one, I think, is from Gym Accessories. I think we have a code with them in the video description, but don't think I word for it. Just check it out and see. Um, So, both are totally viable. I, whenever I go to stuff, I just like to keep stuff compact. Right. Just the deck I'm playing, just the one pack of extra sleeves, 
not too much else. Keep it simple. You do, in tournament, you don't want to be one. You don't want your your materials to feel foreign. So I would not. I would not use a brand of sleeves you're not already comfortable with. Uh, two, you don't want like a huge deck box or too many things rattling around because you don't want to be missing things. Keep because you want to be focused on the game itself. Yeah, and also if like deck checks happen, you get in trouble for having anything that's not in yeah. your deck in your deck box. So like if you just have like those some stray cards you got from trades and you threw them in your deck box because it's like oh my deck box is big and has like multiple compartments I can just keep some stuff in here that could be that does not cheating. fly in official tournaments. Trouble so. Yeah, I just keep it pretty limited. In that way, sidewind just make a lot of sense because uh, you will. It's just not. It's not supposed to hold anything more than what you yeah, need. Like your deck, yeah. So, hopefully, that answers the question. Somewhat helpful and informative, or at least those are our personal picks. I know a lot of people love their like KMC sleeves, mm-hmm. Players Choice. There's all kinds of brands. I can't speak to much of anything beyond the fact that I use a lot of Dragon Shield. And uh, Ultra Pro is also a good second recommendation. If you have a favorite content creator, you can buy their sleeves too. Sam yeah. and like MSC TV, like they've got sleeves. They're good. Uh, those are my friends, but I'm going to be honest here. Their sleeves tend to be a little pricey. <laughs> so like. You got to really like them. You em. know, if you've got deeper pockets to spend on your supplies, then they could be great. However, if you're a cheapo, Ultra Pro is pretty cool. That is all. And that's all for the pot of greed, isn't it? It is. Got another one of these little two hour episodes, it seems like. Um mm. hopefully you guys enjoyed. Shout outs to everybody who's listening live and everybody who leaves kind, positive reviews or submits questions for the pot. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Pastor. <laughs> <laughs>